Welcome back to episode 227 of the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. My name is Josh. I'm here, Troy. I'm here, Baba Louie. What's up, boys? We're uh, missing our fantasy draft right now, Troy. <laughs> we are missing the fantasy draft. But we figured out how to turn the volume off on the notifications. So I think now we all have it up on our screen so we can check and do live check-ins. And I just realized my team. So I'm out of drafting. I think you're out. You you made one pick. Two. Two. And then now you're out of drafting. I think Louie's out of drafting too, because obviously it's going on right now as we're recording. But I noticed I have Brady Kachuk, which automatically means I will get Phil's best player because he'll want to trade for him. Oh, yeah. So well, that might be a like, Nikita Kucherov like, might be coming to my team. Like his top five players. <laughs> it's not a bad move. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've, I've taken three centers in my first three picks. I took McKinnon. Well, number one, that was auto draft, and then to Crosby second round, and then I had to be a homer and pick Bedsy in the third round. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. Might as well. He went in the fourth round, first pick in our. We got two different uh, leagues. Like it's, it is what it is. But yeah, they, he went around the same. It looks like. Oh, and then it just auto drafted Noah Dobson for me. Who do you have, Louis? Uh, Barkov, Crosby, and Drysidel as my centers, and uh, Adam Fox is a D currently. Oh, I like your team. Should we just talk about our fantasy team? Because <laughs> that's what everyone loves to do is hear about your fantasy team. And they really yeah. love it when you tell them about like the bad beat you had because yeah. no one else has ever experienced that. No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Everyone good? You good, yeah. Troy? I'm good. All right. A um, couple of reminders before we get started. First one is if you're a show supporter and you're in Discord, the entries for 5K Challenge is now open. So starting today or yesterday through Sunday, get those entries in. You could win a box of 2023-24 SPA. Maybe get a Connor Bedard Future Auto or another cool card in that box. And believe it or not, guys, there are some people that do support us via Patreon that are not in our Discord. <laughs> if that is you, message us and we'll yeah. get you in right away so you can get your 5K Challenge entries in. Wanted to give an update two on rip party we've gotten a lot of feedback when we announced rip party on our last show almost all of it's been very positive so far so <laughs> I was gonna say, even negative feedback it's okay we get all kinds of feedback <laughs> we'll take it okay. you're gonna get it no matter what right if you're trying new things and we're not afraid to do that here if you didn't hear our announcement our last show rip party is our expo event for people that are really not at the expo because yeah. you know we don't do things normal around here right it's uh they zig we zag sort of sounds weird of course but like i said we do weird stuff here it's going to be a small amount of people in person in toronto ripping tons of boxes on a live stream for everyone to watch on just about every social platform so it'll be streamed everywhere it's friday november 8th starting at 9 p.m uh, we have of course a very strict limit for in-person attendance which is why it's not like an event for you know people at the expo and you know, honestly, too, I think to make the live stream, we wanted it to feel intimate like it did last year while we were at Chateau, uh, all sitting together, opening up boxes. Yeah. Uh, but here's the thing, though. If anyone, you know, isn't going to be there and it's like, oh, man, I wish I was there. It might actually be better that you're, if you're not <laughs> at the Chateau, because in addition to us getting, uh, you know, in addition to us and our guests opening boxes, we're going to be giving away tons of boxes to people watching the live stream that are in the chat. And our goal is to give away a lot of awesome boxes. So again, if it feels like we're trying to make it like exclusive, we're not remember it's kind of an event for people that aren't there or that are too tired. Like Troy and I would be, or, you know, when it, or Louie too, right. We would probably rather sit in our hotel and watch something like this. And so, uh, yeah, it's an event for lazy people like us. So <laughs> there you go. So again, mark your calendars Friday, November 8th, 9 p.m. It's going to be epic for sure. We just don't know if it'll be epically awesome or a complete train wreck, but either way, <laughs> epic, right? And, and uh, you know, we're trying to make it epically awesome, though. We're also getting more sponsors to step up. So the crew from the Late Game movie will be there. They'll be opening boxes. They're going to donate signed movie posters, jerseys, and hats in addition to boxes to give away in the live stream. So I think that's super cool. Uh, we have merch. After uh -oh. two years. Oh, no. Oh. Do you want to give uh, that away yet? Hold on. No, no, no. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> no, no, no. Wanted to bring a merch on our last show, but 
you know, four announcements seem like overkill. It would have been. <laughs> uh, so for two years, Troy, we've been working on merch, and it's been a journey of complete and I'll call utter frustration. More people than I could have ever imagined have asked us when we'll have Gancho merch or swag to purchase so that they can rep our show. And it's really humbling that anyone would want to rep our show, and that's certainly not lost on us. The challenge for a show like ours is how do you produce like really nice, great quality merch without huge buying power? We can't mm -hmm. say, well, we'll buy 40,000 t-shirts or anything like that. So we've tried endless samples and hated them all. <laughs> Mainly t-shirts over literally, like I said, two years. At some point, six months ago, eight months ago, we pulled their Discord community. And what they said is that they want... They do want merch and they want nicer quality stuff. And so that's been our challenge. Now you can throw up our, you know, we pull <laughs> the hobby pole. So finally, after endless vendors and samples, we found a really great hat partner, a t-shirt vendor and a hoodie maker. And a few weeks, weeks ago now, I think, right? A few weeks ago, mm -hmm. launched our pre-sales of uh, what we're calling our founders drop to the Gong Show crew and community in our discord. It's been a little scary, of course, because human nature is to say, like, when you ask people, oh, hey, would you want merch? They're like, uh, most people say, yeah. But then when the rubber hits the road, it could be <laughs> something a little bit different. They're like, nah, dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, Troy, there's a chance that you and I would be wearing, like, the same Gonshaw t-shirt <laughs> basically for the rest of our lives if nobody wanted to wanted to pick it up and rep it. But uh, luckily for our own personal wardrobe sake, and, you know, we sold out, actually, most of the drop already. So, again... Humbling is not even the, a strong enough word for that. But we do have a, a very limited, and I, and I do mean that, I mean very limited amount left that we want to make available to anyone who's listening and watching. Uh, and so we're going to show that right now. So here's kind of our founder's drop. We had two hats. We had the Troy hat, which you're conveniently not wearing. Would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> I wore it the first day, and then this yeah. hat's always sitting up here, so I always yeah. grab it. But yeah, my hat well, sometimes has... You get Oh, okay, you explain your hat. You explain. I'll just explain my hat because I got to get my hat. It's the gray. It's the snapback. It's the curve bill because I'm old school. I'm from the '90s, so I still have the hats and I get them and I want to, you know, take that bill and basically almost do a triangle with it. So I, I that's my my hat. It's got the trucker. Or what do they call it on the back there? The mesh or whatever. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trucker. Oh, Louis wearing it. I. Yeah, Louis got it on. <laughs> then we have the Josh hat. Which I'm wearing, kind of my style, more flat bill, similar to the old kind of school one that I always wear. Yeah, you're more trendy. This is like the this is what the kids today would be wearing, right? Do they I'm still so do? trendy? <laughs> yeah, hats are thirty bucks each. We have a founder's tee, which Louis worked on real hard on. Kind of found us a great vendor for that. Uh, again, uh, thirty dollars there. We have very limited amount of these in a few sizes left. And yeah. then the one I was really most excited about is our founder's hoodie. And all those pictures don't do it justice. It's so nice. And people had in our, going back to our hobby poll, they wanted <laughs> a very high quality one. And so we did that. It's like navy blue outside, red on the inside. And the patch is so nice. It's a twill patch, if you know what that means. I didn't really know until I saw <laughs> a person. I have no, I just know it's a patch. Like, yeah. it, like a legit patch. Like if they came out with like upper deck someday, like a hockey card podcast or set of cards, like, you know, and this was like our Jersey, like this would be in our like cup cards, right? Yeah. Like it's that nice of a patch. It took like six weeks just to get the sample of the patch <laughs> to make the sample of the, cause they, I don't know where it was made, like you know, <laughs> some planet or something like that, but it's just awesome. And I love it. And those are, uh, 75. So if you are interested in a Troy hat, a Josh hat, a, a t-shirt or hoodie, we're kind of doing this gorilla style because we didn't know how popular it would be. We had no idea that it would almost sell out right away in our Discord. Uh, just message us and then we'll get you kind of a shipping estimate and just take care of payment there. But we just wanted to make that available and anything that is left, we'll probably just bring to the expo. Now, do you think we should have done parallels? So someone's going to order... The, the sweatshirt, but then we send them a gold one. <laughs> it's like the one one and they get to rep yeah. the gold one. Maybe that, that's a good idea, but I think you'd have to send them two 
Yeah. Because, oh, like, true, what if they don't true. like gold? And yeah, it's like, well, like, well, I ordered a blue one. And yeah, you I don't, jerks. It's cute. <laughs> that it's, but then you'd have to, like, get, like, the one of one embroidered on it. Oh, that'd be cool. Chew or patch or something like that. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm have, glad I came up with this idea at the very end. That was at sweet. the very end. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Once we ordered everything. <laughs> so, thank you for that. Timing, of course, Troy. Last reminder before we get started is that the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a Patreon podcast, which means we rely on support of listeners like yourself and watchers like yourself to help us cover our show expenses, produce more and what we hope is better hockey card content, and then fund initiatives to grow the hobby, like Rip Party. You can yeah. support us for as little <laughs> as five US dollars a month. Be one of the first 199 supporters of our show, forever have that title. Gotta be a few spots left. Well, it changes somehow. We don't know. <laughs> I don't know why it changes. It keeps going down, up, left, right. I don't know what's going yeah. on. It's very easy to support us. You can go to our website, hockeycardsgongshow.com. Click on the Become a Patron link at the top of the page. Go to the Patreon website directly, p a t r e o n dot com, and search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. There's a link in the show description in both uh, the podcast apps and on YouTube. And then finally, in our Instagram and TikTok profile too. We have three new members since our oh. last show. Only one is in Discord. So. <laughs> Come on, guys. Get in there. Uh, our Rose joined on a 199. H. Collins and the J-Man all joined nice. on a 199. If you do, if you didn't see the link or the invite, message us, and we'll be happy to send you one. Yeah. Hey, Troy. Are you ready for the gong show? You're on mute, buddy. Still on mute, Troy. <laughs> I wait for someone to go back and actually count how many times I have been on mute. <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever missed a show? Oh yeah. Well, I've missed. I haven't. No, no, been no. On. I mean, I mean, where where you've been on and you haven't once been caught on mute. Maybe, maybe a handful of times where I haven't been on mute, but it seems like every episode. It's part of your brand, so it's cute. Like, <laughs> All right, you ready for the game plan? All right, we begin today's show with part four of some of our favorite bad slash ugly hockey cards. They keep getting better, baby. Then we continue our 24-25 NHL season preview with an interview with NHL insider Sean Shapiro. Next, it's hobby news. Then it's off to new product releases. We end the show by looking at some of our favorite hockey cards in the current Fanatics Collect weekly auction and any personal pickups, if anyone has anything. Okay, fellas, it's part four of the bad slash ugly hockey cards of all time. Seems like everyone is on <laughs> waiting with bated breath on what cards are going to show up this time. But again, a big hit. yeah, it's fun researching and finding these. So it's crazy because some of these I've had, I, there's one on today's show. I own it. I have it. I had it really? from my youth. I always remember it. And it's just, I love bringing these up and how just figuring out how cards made it into a set is kind of half the, half the fun in it, but now, I was thinking about this. The more I do like this research on it, don't you think Upper Deck should just throw in some hideous cards as an homage yes. to these past cards? I don't know if they'd have to get approval from some people, but I think it'd be a hilarious Easter egg if you just see Bedard's head on like Matt Rempe's body and they just throw that, that in awesome. <laughs> and totally mis disproportionate. But I know they would never, not in today's image is everything world, probably wouldn't yeah. fly, but I still think it. You just want you want more of those rear end picks. <laughs> they're the, they're the, I think I've done three of them. They're the the top yeah. category so far. No no rear end picks today. So what about get uh, Betsy to dress up like Doug Gilmore in that oh, pinnacle card from last show? He'd look good in the. You think so he'd someone do that? actually? What did someone say? Did someone say he looked like Stevie Ray Vaughan? Which yeah, is a good I thought one. that was yeah. good. That was compared. that maybe was what they were going for. That was a really good one. I'm almost disappointed in myself for not thinking about that. Okay, so without further ado. Here we go. Here's our next round of bad slash ugly hockey cards. First one, we have. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> Let's zoom in. We have a 1971 OPC Larry Hillman number 168. All right, another great bad hockey card. It's one of our favorite categories. Let's put the player's head on a different body, and who cares that it looks completely ridiculous? Now. Larry Hillman was traded on December 16th, 1971 from Philly to the LA Kings. And why did I say the Kings? No, that's wrong. He was, they had to, it must've been the Sabres he got traded to because they had to use their magic to try to put him in a Sabres yeah. Jersey. 
Good thing I was uh, on the ball with that one. So what OPT decided to do was, hey, we got to put this guy's head on somebody. Well, we're going to use Dave Dryden, okay? Dave Dryden's our player on the Sabres that we're going to put his head on. So here is Dave Dryden, okay? Let me zoom, see the whole card. Here, Larry Hillman. It looks okay. We're all, we're all okay yeah. now. But let's do some <laughs> let's do some well, more digging. So well, one on. thing, go back to oh. the other picture. No, you're you're. I, I think you're going to get to one of the oh. very bad things about this picture. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so obviously, Larry Hillman. If you're if you're not watching this, he's like hunched over, looking like a goalie. Right? He's got a goalie pose yeah. because hey, Dave Dryden's a goalie. That's whose body we used. One problem. Larry Hillman is not a goalie. He is a defenseman. So oh, no. they put Larry Hillman on the bo- or his head on the body of a goalie and just, hey, number 30, sure, go for it. But there's uh, Dave Dryden. So they made a defenseman turn into a goalie, but then he's also got the floating head where you can – there's, like, no neck. You can see a little none. bit of a neck. No, there's none. There's, like, no <laughs> – it's, it's like he scrunched his shoulders up as high as he could. Yeah. In the in the photo, and yeah, you can see like the chest protector. Yes, <laughs> on, and on it's the like, I still love how they kind of like somehow they kind of turn. Whoops, they kind of like turn the picket because the strings are a little different. I just it cracks me up how they try to make it look like it's not the same, but it is the same. But absolutely ridiculous card. One of my favorites. I love the f- new head or the different heads on bodies. It's one of my favorite things. And either like his head is too big. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. it's they just couldn't get the proportions right ever, it seems. Mm -hmm. So Larry Hillman played 19 seasons in the NHL with Detroit, Boston, Toronto, the North Stars, Montreal, Philly, L.A., and Buffalo. For his career, Hillman scored 36 goals, 196 assists for 232 points and 789 games played. Four-time cup winner, though. So good for him. Yeah. PSA 10 pop count in this card is eight. With a gem rate of 4%. Last sale of a PSA 10 copy of this card I could find was on May 26th of 2023 via eBay. Verified in Terapeak for $297.65 US. Big money. But Okay, I have a couple honest. questions before you yeah. move on, though. Yeah. Why is it all these 1971 cards? Have you noticed that? Yeah, because I think basically probably with the production schedules and when people got traded, they tried to... There was a decision made at some point that we want these guys in the team jersey of the new team. Because in the past, they used to put, like, there would be text on the card. It said, now with, oh, sorry, as I, hit, I feel like Phil, I just hit my mic. Yeah. I got my hands waving. But old, they used to do, like, now with, whatever, Montreal. It'd say something like that. But it just seems like they decided to take a different route. And it, I don't know if it worked. <laughs> it gave us a lot to talk about. But. Somebody had a really bad idea. And then my next question is, I don't know this. Maybe you do. Is Dave Dryden the goalie related to Ken Dryden the goalie? Oh, I don't know. I'm prob- I I don't know that, but he might be. Oh, I'll uh, I'll let Louie if he wants to try to figure that one out. But it sounds like he should be, <laughs> but we don't know. All right, that's our boy. First one, Larry Hillman, head on Dave Dryden body. All right, Josh, here's the classic one. This is the one I owned, or I still own it. Right here. We're zoomed in a little. 1983 OPG Mel Bridgman, or I don't know if it's Bridgman or Brig. It's really there's no E in his name. I just say Bridgman, but number 226. This card is an absolute classic. I own this card, so that makes it, <laughs> I guess, cool for me. It was in my collection as a kid. It's by far one of my favorite all time hockey cards ever. So if, if you're uh, not look watching, who play, look who he's playing for, boy. Look who he's yeah, playing he's got for. The, playing for the Devils. <laughs> playing for the Devils. So let's start with this picture. Okay. Now, I'm sure there's had to be more flattering pictures, but they decided to go with an angry, toothless Mel for the photo. His face is so bad, and there's he barely has any teeth, but secretly I kind of love it, and I think it's almost like a perfect picture of a hockey player from that era. There's so much going on here, Troy. I'm almost speechless. It's, I know it's 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 absolutely insane. So terrible. How many, how many ways does his nose bend? Yes, 
nose bends, the shadow, the lighting. It's just, it's just no horrible. teeth. No teeth. Well, what, well, he has three. It looks like teeth. <laughs> Couple out teeth of control up mustache, and then the the helmet. What the heck is yep. that? We'll, we'll get to the helmet. We'll okay. get to the helmet. So Bridge was traded by Calgary on June twentieth, nineteen eighty three. So he got traded, I think, from Calgary to New Jersey, obviously. So OPG had to do their magic and go to the airbrush well. But yeah, I, I said the most egregious thing on this card. If you're not, if you're listening only, he's got this airbrushed helmet that is massive. It's way too big for his head. Why is it gray? No one knows. I watched, I went and watched footage of 1983 Devils games. They didn't wear a gray helmet. I never saw a gray helmet, but maybe they did. Maybe I missed something. But I saw a red helmet. I saw a white helmet. I never saw a gray helmet, but for some reason, he is in a gray helmet. Hmm. Now, the helmet, the color is ridiculous, but actually, it's floating on his head. It's not even on his, like, it's not sitting on his head. If you look, it's like floating. So I don't know what they're trying to go for. They just totally missed putting his head into the helmet. But... And then if you look, his jersey, again, it's painted on. I don't even know if the striping's right. Probably is. But again, they try those silver shadow things. It doesn't work. So the only thing basically legit in this picture is his, is his front face. Even his neck looks painted. So it's, oh. it is a very bad card. Very bad. So, but very bad, but good card. I'll call it that. Is that like not a real helmet? Is this like a so land I've, of I've seen. I definitely have seen this type of helmet, I think. I tried to look and find it. I want to say I remember Russians wearing this kind of helmet a lot. Okay. But I could be totally wrong, but I, I feel like that helmet is some, resembles something close that players wore, but definitely not gray. I don't know where they got the gray from. Do you know what this card reminds me of? And I want to see if, if this makes sense to you guys. Ooh, let's hear it. Not totally, but almost like a garbage pail esque rendition of a hockey card. Uh, maybe, yeah, it could definitely. Um, okay, looking at that picture, yeah, how old do you think he is there? <laughs> I don't know, he looks like he's 45, <laughs> 29. Yeah, 29. It's, I don't know if it's just that we're getting older, but man, you look at some of these, like, what's his name, Wilfred Brimley. If you look at back at Cocoon and stuff, he was like 35 and he looked like he was dang near 60. I don't know. It's just something about this era of player. They all look old. <laughs> yeah. Bad. All right. So our boy Mel, he was a center, played 14 seasons in the NHL with Philly, Calgary, New Jersey, Detroit, and Vancouver. Hey, he was he could score 252 goals, 449 assists, 701 points, and 977 games played. PSA 10 pop car. He, PSA 10 pop count of this card is 11 with a 79% gem rate. Last sale of this card I could find was on August 31st, 2023 for $29.99 US. And that's for a PSA 10 copy, not a raw copy. So classic. That is insane. And you have this, huh? I have this. It's in my pile. I got it right. I just like right behind me. I should grab it. Okay. Well, last question. Were helmets mandatory in 78? No, no way. So I wonder, like, why they would go through the effort to paint one on that. Is that kind of <laughs> I don't maybe because it had. I don't know. Like, you th I, I'm trying oh. to think what the picture. But if say it did have a helmet, just retouch that. Like, yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Maybe he didn't have a helmet on, and they felt he needed a helmet. I don't know, but I feel okay. like mandatory helmet wasn't because I remember Doug Wilson playing when I was a kid without a helmet. Willie Plett. Harold yeah. snaps. There were still guys. I know. And I know they changed the rule and then guys got grandfathered in. And I want to say like. Almost into the early nineties. Wasn't yeah, it? Was it like McSorley or. I don't Bill know. Bill one of the last who, ones too. To, what's uh, that? To, wasn't Bill Guerin one of the last ones? Maybe someone will know who it was. There's probably, it's a probably great trivia question. Who's the last player not to wear a helmet. Um, but yeah. So yeah, that I don't know. That's interesting why they decided to go there out with this helmet. Maybe someone knows why. All right, Josh, here we go. Next one, Louie, get ready. 1997 Sports Illustrated for Kids. Eric Lindros, <laughs> number 263. This, I don't even want to call it a hockey card, but it is a card of some sort. Uh, now, this card speaks for itself. It uh, was from a Halloween issue of SI for Kids. So that is why we have Eric Lindros dressed up in a pink tutu as a ballerina on ice skates. Now, 
this is perfect. This is how I always pictured him. <laughs> oh boy. Ooh, hate, mail. Hate, hate mail coming to Louie. <laughs> now, my first thought is Shots I don't fired. think this picture Shots would fired. ever fly in anything. To do. Like, there's no way they could do this. They would get people would scream at him or something, but it's uh yeah, you can that's kind of for doing this, that's for sure. <laughs> I love this card. This is awesome. Well, I just I, I'm always curious, like in this situation, Sports Illustrated for Kid, they use his name. Do they have to get approval for this? Like, are they just like here, we're just gonna do this and we'll see what happens. I mean, and then you look at the back of the card, it's like Eric is one of the hockey's toughest players. No <laughs> one dare laugh at him, even if you are a ballerina's pink tutu, and then goes on to give some stats about him. But again, kind of a ridiculous card. <laughs> I don't know. I I just I, I mm. you two this definitely deserves a bad one of our favorite bad ugly cards. Well, I feel bad because I haven't given my dog's been freaking out, and then my wife just had to like sneak in and <laughs> take him because apparently there's something like a, a squirrel or something like that in the backyard. <laughs> How do you keep topping yourself with these? Like, <laughs> I thought the Doug Gilmore was going to be like the the Mount Rushmore, the apex uh, of ugly digging. hockey cards. Yeah, this is absolutely crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh... It's quite something. With the, I like the, the frizzy white on the front of the tutu. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's nuts. And obviously, Lindros, Hall of Famer, 13 seasons in the NHL, stints in Philly, New York, with the Rangers, Toronto, and Dallas. 372 career goals, 493 assists, 865 points, 760 games played. Josh and Louis, the PSA 10 pop count of this card is one. Mm. It has a gem rate of 20%. eBay 101. eBay 101. I couldn't find a sale of the PSA 10, but raw copies of this card or the last sale of a raw copy was on April 7th of this year for $3.49 US. So greater than a dollar. There you go. Wow. Have, have at it. All right, Josh, Louie. Last card for today. 1986. OPG. Gary Nyland. Yes, it's another bad airbrush, but we also have one of the I don't know if it is, but one of the first instances that I've seen of Hockey Mouth. <laughs> oh, Hockey Mouth Hall of Fame here for sure. Yes. Hockey, Hockey Mouth, Mouth Hall of Fame. Fame. If you're not watching on video, Gary Nyland's mouth is fully agape, I think is the word we're going to use. Agape, there you go. Wide open. Stare. I don't know if he saw something horrendous. Maybe he's looking or thinking about <laughs> this hockey card. I don't know. But so it's we the moment you realized you pooped your pants. Yes. We got to set the stage for this card, though. So August 27th, 86, Nyland was signed as a free agent by Chicago after playing the previous season with Toronto. Okay, so we already talked about we have a great example of hockey mouth. Fantastic hockey mouth. Second, if you notice his helmet and gloves, they're blue. They decided, oh, yeah. well, he played for Toronto. We're going to use that picture. We don't need to touch up the helmet or <laughs> gloves. We're just going to leave those as is, even though the Blackhawks would never wear a blue helmet or blue gloves. So they just decided to leave that, let that go. And now the absolute worst thing about the, the jersey. Okay, hmm. let's start. Yes. This isn't the right jersey. Like there's no striping. The striping's all wrong on this jersey. But then let's look at this monstrosity. Oh, my gosh. They, they decided to draw the Blackhawk. And at the bottom right, you'll see the actual logo. Like that's clean, yeah. looks good, iconic logo. The one on the jersey, not so much. It looks deformed, and you know, you can, we can we're, we're not going to get a whole debate on if teams should have Native American or Indigenous uh, logos and, and team names. But sure. in the former respect, at least respect the logo and make it right. Like this is ridiculous. I mean, this is <laughs> this is just bad. <laughs> like, I think you made the perfect point earlier on these. Why didn't they just go with the? Traded to yeah, just use the old jersey and, and put him in the. Wouldn't that, in retrospect, have been like a million times better? Yeah, they probably got emails from or not emails. <laughs> uh, probably got phone calls or angry <laughs> letters from people like me back then, going, "You need to get with the times and get them in the right uniforms." <laughs> but when yeah, did they start? When you brought that up, Josh, when did they start doing that? I remember when I was going through a bunch of those ninety ninety one. Pro set cards. A lot of guys were in wrong unis, but it's set on there. Traded too. Yeah, maybe I started that. I seem to remember. Like, maybe they did it after the bad Photoshop's, right? Maybe they just. 
So yeah, this this is an all time classic. Hockey mouth, wrong colors, terrible jersey, and a completely hideous logo on the front. Hideous. It is is really bad. But all right, our boy Nyland, Gary Nyland, right? Defenseman played eleven seasons in the NHL with Toronto, Chicago, and the Islanders. Thirty two goals, one hundred thirty nine assists, one hundred seventy one points, and six hundred and eight games played. PSA ten pop count. Now this card is one. Gem rate fourteen percent. Couldn't find a sale of a PSA ten, but Rock Hop these go for under one dollar. So there we have it. Round four in the book. Well, um, here's the thing about the the nineteen eighty six OPC Gary not Gary Nyland. Now somebody new in the hobby, they're probably gonna you know take the average take the the every man's route and they'll be hunting their Patrick Waugh rookies. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're an experienced hobbyist, <laughs> if you're an expert at hockey cards. You don't want the WA rookie. You want the Hockey Mouth Hall of Fame, Gary Nyland. <laughs> there you go. 43. Good job, hey, Josh. Josh, you got a rewind sounder on the button bar yet? Why? Because I'm going to go back. Okay. Troy, back to your Larry Hillman with Dave Dryden's body. Yeah. Dave, is. Dave Dryden is the older brother. Of Ken Dryden. There we go. Oh, there we go. Baba Louie coming through. There you go, man. Thank you for that. Okay. We're going to move on make a quick mention for Gong Show Partner Sponsor Slab Sharks. And of course, we're grateful for their support of our show. The current Slab Sharks weekly eBay auction ends tonight. <coughs> it's a monster with something like, what, 2,400 cards ending, which is crazy. Yeah, I'm just going to put that on the screen. How yeah. about that? Yeah. The uh, huge <laughs> OPG Platinum Bedard Autos, a bunch of them. Like this Emerald Surge out of 10, it's currently it's still sitting at what, 18,300 Canadian, yep. which is what, 13, 14,000 US, something like that. Yeah. That's a lot of dough for a Bedard Ricky Auto. Bunch of other huge cards, too. You got to check it out at slapsharks.com. And if you're a Canadian hockey cards collector or looking to take advantage of one of the key selling times in the year, which of course is at the beginning of the season, we'd recommend yep. checking out Slab Sharks eBay consignment services because they take uh, care of all the hassles selling your cards on eBay for you. They literally do all the work. Plus your cards get listed in the weekly Slab Sharks auctions, which the whole hobby knows about. Uh, you know, know that there's always bangers and your cards will get the best chance to reach tons of potential bidders. So for complete consignment info and to get the process started today, head to slabsharks.com. Check them out this weekend at the Montreal Expo, and you can drop off your cards there to submit to. And then also, remember, we're teaming up with Slab Sharks at the Fall Expo in Toronto next month. We'll be recording our show and a number of additional interviews live from the Slab Shark studio on the on the floor of the Toronto Sport Card Expo. So please come by our studio space, meet us, watch the show if we're recording, and just hang out uh, if we're not. Well, we're going to... it's. The NHL season, it's uh, here before our next show. And we were fortunate earlier this week to have the opportunity to chat with another NHL media member and insider, Sean Shapiro, yeah. courtesy of our friends at the Late Game Movie, to help us round out, close out our 2024-25 preview series. So I just love having these writers and you know connected reporters on the show. It feels like we get kind of that inside scoop, or it's almost like having, as a hockey cards collector, like ins insider trading info, but legal, <laughs> True. of course, True. you know, uh, not illegal. Uh, <laughs> Sean has been a writer for the athletic, which we of course both love so much. He's been a beat writer for the Dallas stars, uh, general wealth and knowledge around the current happenings around the national hockey league. So we hope you enjoy our conversation with Sean and find his insight, uh, or find his information as insightful as we did. Mm -hmm. All right. We're very excited to welcome hockey journalist, NHL media member Sean Shapiro, his first appearance on the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. Uh, hey, Sean, how's it going? I'm doing good, guys. How about yourself? Not too bad. Okay, because it's your first time on the show, maybe I thought <laughs> the best place to start would be to give us a little background on yeah. your NHL media career for maybe those who are not familiar with your work. Yeah, so I have a... I have, I basically am kind of a jack-of-all-trades in the space. That was... Uh, kind of embraced and figure out the new age media world over the past couple of years. Um, I was at one point with uh, one company and got the, a result, a side effect of the industry changing contracts and things like that. So um, 
but now I am a, my main gig is my, my largest gig that people would know is elite prospects. I, I'm actually, I do a lot of work with elite prospects. Um, I'm actually right now, um, the ex, I'm actually the interim editor in chief at elite prospects is editorial oh, wow. side right now. Um, that's something that's a new development in the last week. My, the JD Burke is still the editor in chief there, but he's been, de- he's dealing with some, um, personal chronic pain thing. So wishing the best to JD and I'm kind of helping keep steer the ship while he's out. But, um, from elite prospects, um, I do, I, I work for the all city network now based out of Dallas, the all DLLS. And, and then I, and then I do my own stuff through, uh, the direct to reader space, uh, through my sub stack of shap shots and a couple other various podcast projects here and there. But basically I spend a lot of time at hockey rinks and I enjoy it and I don't really there have to go. work. I, and, and I, and I get, I get, I, it's, it's a good life. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. Josh, Josh, I'm going to get you mad now. Cause he said elite prospects. I, I didn't realize you were on that site. So yeah. I brought up my page and I was going to show it to everyone, but I won't because <laughs> all it is is coaching. It's no, uh, no playing, yeah. but I, Josh always gets mad when I say, "Oh, I played there. I did that." <laughs> it's uh, we, we get to one of the things that I've gotten to see a little bit of, and I'm not on the full like operation side for the, the stat database <laughs> yeah. part of it, but you get to hear some of the the, the background stories on how things go. Like and uh, like at one point, the you always hear people wanting their stats updated, but like at one point. <laughs> um, they, we, they were telling me the story. They recently had a person asked to have their page taken off because oh, by ha- but because because by having a uh, elite prospects page, they weren't eligible to play in their local beer league. <laughs> so like they were trying to get a, they were trying to get it removed so that they could still uh, so they would yeah, be all, all, all mine says is yeah <laughs> my name goaltending coach yeah. Minnesota high school hockey yeah. That's all <laughs> and I gotta yeah. I gotta give you a shout out. I know we'll talk. You'll do your plugs yeah. at the end, but your Substack. I really like the art. You, you go down a different path sometimes. Like I don't see a lot of articles on the benefits of an offhand winger, which I just, I, I just want to say, I love some of the stuff you write. So I just wanted to. No, well, thank you. Thank Thank you for doing Thanks for, yeah. Thanks for saying that. It's yeah. It's uh, I like to, as I kind of tell people, the sub stack space is kind of like my own personal sandbox yeah. where my brain is a bit fanatical in ways it jumps around to different things and f- gets fixated on various hockey things. And, <laughs> and just, the sub stack for me has been a space where I've been able to like, I like that, that, that concept of just the offhand winger, just those things that are, yeah. I'm not necessarily going to get a mainstream media outlet to pay me to do that. So why not just do it myself and yep. get, bring it yeah. right to readers. So, yeah. So you've had a, a vast experience so far in your career. You've been a beat writer, you've been a columnist and you've, uh, you know, now you're in the, the new world of media where we're all kind of trying to figure it out. What experiences do you have in the hockey card hobby? Has that been newer to you or did you collect as a kid? That sort of thing. So, yeah, I am newer into it again. I am. I was the kid who I collected as a kid, but not really anything high end. It was just always as a kid. I was so I was to give people an idea. I was born in 89. So I was my entire childhood yeah. is the existence of <laughs> i think everything's cool and i think i have the cool wayne gretzky card and then i go to and then i go to school and six other kids have the cool <laughs> cool wayne gretzky card so it was kind of um it's kind of something where i it was something that was cool to me as a kid and then kind of fell off just when you as, as i got a little bit older and it felt like well this is not i get i get told this is all unique and it's not what yeah. it is i'm sure there's lots of people around my age who grew up in the nineties that way and had a similar experience mm-hmm. of like, um, and then I got back more into it myself, like within the last six, seven months, just something through and we'll talk about it earlier, like through, through the late movie. Game. Yeah. Through the late yeah. game, through the movie with, um, they got a little bit into the card space and it was, so I got a little bit more into it through the past, in past six, seven months now. And it's something that I find it's kind of cool to, it's it's for me it's a pretty cool thing to i like a lot of the and it's the reason like i got into sports writing in the first place is i'm a big fan of the historical concept of sports yeah. like i like i'm a, i think it's such a cool like way we mark time and you have different memories and so like like for me just as someone who's a as a, as a big goalie guy right like i it's kind of it's been kind of a cool way for me to go through and look at stuff and and try to collect some stuff for that i that reminds me of goalies I grew up watching as a kid and, and 
other stuff like history of the position. Like to me, I think it's that's kind of how I got more back into the hobby in the past six, seven months of, of from from what came from a card perspective. And it's uh, it's kind of funny because like if you had told me after like I went through and I looked through the old box that was sitting in the, the my parents' basement of the old cards that were basically all junk because of so it's kind of funny it's, it's kind of funny to have to see how it's changed in, in a positive way now <laughs> oh yeah who is your goalie that you followed growing up like who is your idol so I, I grew up in so I grew up in in North Jersey first so I grew up as a Brodor fan like I was I was yeah. and I was I was six years old in 95 and then I was and when they won the cup in 2000 I was 11 or whatever it was so it's like it was kind of that like golden age of <laughs> of sports so but the thing for me that was great about where we lived we lived in northern new jersey and so we got and this was before the nhl center ice package was a real big thing we i grew up in a spot where between getting every basically every devils game every every rangers game we also got probably about 20 to 15 to 20 Sabres games like because they were like MSG2 mm. or whatever and so whatever if the Rangers and Islanders weren't playing that night like you got the Sabres game because yeah. it was another like fill in so like I was at that spot where I grew up as a kid like I was a Devils fan a big Brodor fan but I was able to it, 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 I could watch and flip on the TV and I could watch Hashik on a yeah. semi-regular basis I could I could watch there was uh as I got a little bit older, like you go from in the Rangers hi, hierarchy, I know there's a little bit of gap in there, but you go mm-hmm. from Richter to, to Lundqvist and, and every, like it's, so that was kind of, for me, it was just kind of that little being in that part was a really great thing for me as a young hockey fan mm-hmm. and someone who wanted to got, got attracted to playing goal. He was like, Oh, I could go watch these guys. And so that, that, that was a big one for me. Like it was, it was Brodor was, was always the one that got me into it. But then it was seeing Ashik play, seeing um, seeing as much as I like rooted hard against the Rangers. I was the diehard Devils fan as a kid. But like it was like it was like oh, I want to see him win. But I'd, I'd like to see like like one of my like favorite games. Like I remember back, and I can't remember whether it was Lundqvist's first start against New Jersey or whatever. But it's like the game where him and Brodor, they both had like. 38, 38, 40, one of them was like, the, sh- the shot was like an 80 shot game. And it was like two, one. And it was like, wow. two, dude, it was like two, one or something like that. And like, those were like my favorite games. Like the devils won the game, but it was like, like I, I liked the Rangers goalies. So, Okay. I want to stick here for actually for a minute. Yeah. And yeah. I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but since we're on the topic, you know, Troy's a goalie coach here in Minnesota. And we've talked about this all the time that we don't seem to have like the strongest kind of goalie market right now because it feels like all these goalies are so up and down. Like there's no dominator yeah. who, when, you know, we were, we're a little bit older than you, but I remember the Hashik era very well when it's like, okay, your team's playing Buffalo. It's like, we're not scoring tonight. Yeah. It's not yeah. gonna, it's not gonna happen. And, you know, Troy has said for a while that he feels that, the offensive side of the game is ahead, like just has advanced mm-hmm. yeah. past the the goaltending at this point. Do you feel that same way too, or why do we not have that dominant <laughs> kind of goalie today? So I have a couple. You, you hit a topic that I love, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna nerd out about this for a second. <laughs> so um, I think there's a couple things. First, I think the divide has never been closer. I think I think the there used to be you watch teams there used to be a, a clear split across the board like even if a team didn't have a top 5 goalie you still felt if a guy if you someone was playing their backup it was a, a downgrade like I feel like yeah. I feel like part of that well, has skill set you're saying yeah. skill like yeah, yeah, between yeah, yeah, the yeah. starter and the backup goalie is these guys are the most skilled they've ever been oh yeah and so yeah and, and so like i look at it that way where there's a bit of mm. that narrative has died where it's like it used to be like to be a dominant guy where it was like well you only we can only win when our starters in that right like yeah. that was a very much a thing <laughs> the backup at a 4.2 yeah exactly and so, yeah, yeah the <laughs> other thing and and the other thing that i think and this is someone who played the position growing up and and like i, I watch now and I, i'm i'm based in even though i'm doing this call from denver right now with you guys i'm based in detroit i'm based 20 minutes from where usa hockey arena is and, and mm-hmm. i get to see the national team development program quite a bit and them run things is um basically the skill and development for skaters just like skyrocketed over goaltending because it started it took one of the most basic things and this is this is how I look at the world where 
one of the things that made goaltending great, like if you, and if you kind of look at the spot was it was the specialized coaching and it was the, it was the, um, the, the, the individual skill based training where it was Mm -hmm. the, the working in the short side game, the small side things, these things where goalies had to work and learn and solve problems. Right. And that was kind of, and then, and only goalies were getting it for the longest time. And then we had a switch and we had a switch where all of a sudden all these other kids, um, all these, these players and skaters, they looked at it and like, wait, and mom and dads said, Hey, if I, if they can pay for the, the goalie to go get personalized training, why can't, <laughs> why can't I get the skill time for the skaters and the shooters? And, and so they, this, this was what was a goaltending, like, only thing goalie did like oh you get extra skill training for your goalie that was really one of the like when i was in the nine kid growing up in the 90s that was one of the big things it's not like you had a lot of individualized skill training for skaters and everything mm-hmm. now they all now all the kids have a skating coach they have a skills coach they have a stick handling coach that caught up and at the same time players have been taught more and more to be creative to it's been like hey this is work from out of this and while that's been happening on the skating side Goaltending, I think, too often has become a little bit too mo- too too robotic. Where we have so many guys who are so technically skilled and mm-hmm. uh, and, and and are able to do things that players never before them never were never were able to do. Like we call it the, mean, goalie, uh, the goalie school goalie. They they're great yeah, in goalie yeah. school and in individual stuff, but get a game and creativity, they just yeah, and there. it's and and they never became problem solvers and that's yep. the big thing where like i think that's the biggest thing where you had players were players and skaters were given all of this space to be told how do you create how do you make life more difficult and at the same time goalies were just being taught well shot from the corner you're doing this guy comes in here mm-hmm. you go to your rvh so much of goaltending to me is taking things that should have been lessons about improvision and turning them into well this is what works all the time like one of the great stories about Jonathan Quick invented the RVH basically popularized mm-hmm. it depending on what you want to use and quick as I've even talked to quick about it before the reason it happened was it was an improvisation mid-series because the Sedines were killing him down low like <laughs> it, like it was the whole thing where it's like the Sedines in that series were just killing him down low and the RVH was kind of bored of like okay how do I adapt to stop what this is with this little little one two play the Sedines are running <laughs> down low and the whole lesson the goaltending world effectively took for many people was, oh, well, now we must do the RVH, as opposed to what should have been the lesson was, oh, you can create a problem, create a solution from a problem. So yeah. that, that to me is the that, – this is a bit, that's a bit of my goalie soapbox, and I'm fine with – I love getting on that. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Well, of the young goaltenders, because there are a couple really interesting young players, uh, one yeah. of them – is from our town. We're in Farmington, Minnesota, and Jake Ottinger yeah. is a product of, of our town. You know, who, who would you say has the, you know, if we're going to have a, a Brodeur type or a Hashek or uh, is lucky to find like a, a, go- a goalie with the creativity and flair of like a Patrick Waugh, is there anybody now that's playing that you could see taking that mantle or does the position need to? evolve or the the way it's a pro- the position is approached need to evolve to get back to that um yeah i mean it's if you look at like kind of young guys coming up right um like you look through elite prospects i recently went through kind of cross looking at all the goalie depth charts and where everything's going and like like you look at it's like I love the potential of Yaroslav Askarov. Like from a goaltending perspective, mm-hmm. like like from a technical skill and skating perspective, like you look at that and you're like, that guy should be a multiple Vesna trophy winner. That's what Yaroslav Askarov yeah. should be in my mind. You look at him. It's also one where is he going to you've seen him in the AHL. He's lost the net to Troy Grossneck before. He's had this mm-hmm. like when he was in Milwaukee. And is is he going to have that 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 main line to basically be that guy? Like he's like so he's a guy who I'm really intrigued about. Like I think I think Wallstead is is in, obviously you guys know with being in Minnesota, Wallstead. I was gonna is say please yeah, say yeah. Wallstead. Please say Wallstead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, for the last nine years it's been yes for Wallstead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh the one, the one I really like, just the goalie that I, I find incredibly intriguing to watch, and I like the way he plays because 
Um, and he's going to get a chance to have more of a role this year after Calgary made the trade. But I, I love Dustin Wolf. Like I was just kind of hoping yeah, you were saying him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Dustin Wolf to me is the big one. Like I look at him where he of like when you look at like high high floor of like young goalies right now to me he's probably got one of the highest floors i think he has a really high ceiling too but like he he's a guy who i i look at as he's going to come into a situation he's going to like i think like i worry about askarov in san jose just because he's a guy he's an emotion he's, he's an emotional guy who builds off his emotions and if he comes into San Jose and they're going to struggle for a couple of years, I don't know how well that's going to play there. Like Wolf to me, I, I, I like the way he's a little bit more creative in his save selections. I like the way he mentally attacks the game to me. He's a guy and I see a spot where Calgary going to be great this year. No, but I at least see the enough of the structure where a young goalie is not going to be tanked confidence wise by the team in front of him. So like, I, I, I like Wolf a lot. That's, to get to that point, I guess. <laughs> what I find intriguing about Wolf is he's the sort of atypical non prototype goalie. Yeah, he's not oh, like, yeah. like we, we were at the rookie showcase and Bob and Louie and I were like a foot away from Ivan Fedotov and I couldn't oh, yeah. believe how big he was. I was like, yeah. Oh my god, this guy's seven feet tall. And and then you got Wolf who's what like six one, six foot. He yeah. he does I'm like how high maybe. does he yeah, <laughs> yeah how high does he jump do you know, yeah. I know that's a good uh, question I, that's a good question <laughs> that's I, I love that I, I love that part but like yeah he's uh but like, he's also one of those two where like Wolf is one of those classic examples of when someone shows us they're the best amongst their peers. Mm-hmm you have to believe them, right? Like so many times, like with a, with a smaller goalie, you're like, you, you try to find ways to pick at his game. Where like, if he had one of the years he had in the AHL, just one of them. And now for, for people who don't know, basically for three years in a row, he was the AHL's best player, not just goalie, AHL's best player. And if you have one year like that, you kind of try to find like, oh, he's a, like, to me, like every, the one knock is like, oh, he's only six one or whatever. But it's, He's just between every level he's been at the age. I, I think success. I'm a big believer that success in the AHL as a young goalie, we need to give more credence to it because it is the hardest jump in my mind. A player makes no matter what the position, but goaltending in particular, the jump from junior or college to the AHL is, is, is incredibly difficult. And like, I mentioned Askarov before. Askarov has struggled with that coming over from Russia to there. And there's a little bit of the, the, the learning curve. We saw Sebastian Kosa mm-hmm. in Detroit has struggled with it here and there. Dustin Wolf has gone through. And I know maybe his numbers when he started for Calgary last year weren't immaculate. But what he's done in the AHL to me is a huge marker of this is a guy who's going to figure it out and is going to keep kind of growing. And, and as the league learns him, this is a big thing I go back to. It's the classic like um, – uh, Andrew Rickraft wins the call there, right, for Boston, and yep. it's great. And then two years later, everyone figured out his weaknesses, and he never <laughs> adapted. I think Wolf is someone who, as the league learns him, he will learn the league, and I think it kind of he continues to grow. So, mm-hmm. hey Troy, we're at like ten straight minutes of goalie talk. Are you- <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have the highest rated show ever. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, it's like I love this because yeah. I love talking about atypical goalies. Um, like Saros is another guy. Yeah, yes, yeah. He's not, he's not a monster. I'm a big Levi guy. I know he kind of struggled for his first yeah. year. I've always been a fan of him, even when he's at college. I hope he's kind of. I love yeah. the whole, you know, Jedi meditating thing. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, there's a there's a site in Goal Magazine. I'm sure you've heard of it. They yeah. subscribe to it. He always does breakdowns on there, so I love that he's like really open about his stuff. So I, I really hope Levi as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so too. He's a, I think he's a, he's another good young guy. That whole Buffalo situation's wild. Yeah, they got right two now. good goalies. I think. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Well, then so. you got UPL, who's like another yeah. giant, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. Okay. Well, okay. Now here's like kind of a big picture NHL question, but it's sort of yeah. goalie adjacent. So. I was looking earlier today and one of the things we've marveled at the last couple of years is over the last 30 years, the last three years have been kind of the highest scoring almost in, in that whole time period where I think three years in a row now we're over 3.1 goals per game yeah. average. Do you see that trend continuing because a lot of goals drive a lot of success in the hobby for players yeah. and just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and I don't think it's just the, and like also, this is the, 
for this is the third or fourth year in a row, average, league average save percentage dropped. I think it was the mm-hmm. lowest since the first year out of the, the lockout. Um, so lowest, effectively lowest in the modern era where there was actual stuff before. Um, I think the other part of it is, I, I don't think it's just the goaltending. I think in today's NHL too, I think so much more is, and, and coaches don't like it, but like the game isn't as structured as it used to be, right? Like you have more, like you get more younger guys. Um, I think it's, it makes the game more exciting. It's great, but you get more younger guys getting a chance earlier. You, you get guys jumping to the lineup, guys who used to only make the NHL. It used to be, you have to, in most cases, it used to be, you have to have the structure in your game to make the NHL. And now it's become more and more of, you have the skill in your game and we can try to add structure to it. And so in that all, like, I think you get a lot more raw product in the way. So more chaos mm-hmm. happens and more chaos leads to more goals. Like I, in Detroit, one of the things like I've, I've talked to Patrick Kane quite a bit about just kind of his experience watching the league as someone who came in as a uh, 19 year old, 18, 19 year old, and then had the, and has now been become a veteran player. And it's in his words. And it's like, it's funny. Cause like when, 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 um, when, when, when Torts says it, all of a sudden people think he's crazy. But when a player <laughs> says it, it's not like the league is dumber, right? Like the like the the, the, the league the league is dumber. The guys, the the structure isn't as defensively structure isn't as solid as it used to be. There's more, there's more and more of a push on. Hey, let's get ex, let's flood the offensive zone, get more guys in. That leads to more going back against you. So it's 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 a more chaotic game, and I think that's not going to change because the coaches as much as they like aren't going to get the like the magic sauce to freeze everything and 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 be able to fix the well do you think that's the analytics push too with everything you know Corsi and everything shot attempts and expected goals and all your all your fun Uh, analytics stuff yeah i mean i i think i think that's part of it where i I think Mm -hmm. like the aggressiveness is and we've seen in all sports it's the uh you you see like no the fourth down, like go for it on fourth down all the time in yep. football. And, 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 and the, and so I, I think that has a little bit of an impact. I think it's, I, I really think it's more of the, it's, it's more, it's more fun to play offense. <laughs> and, and, there, and there's more, and there's more teams that have been willing to effectively apply that blanket system across all four yeah. lines that's the other big thing right where like yeah. even five years ago you would still have like hey we've got our our checking line and and and, yep. and, and everything like that and the, the checking line is effectively dying right yep. like you look at you look at florida where like okay you have matchup when's the cup last year you have matchup lines you don't really have a checking line you look at you look across the the, the best teams that are going to be cup contenders there's no solid there's every all there's a threat offensively on every line and that's the other big push stretch too not stretch big trend too so yeah okay so we think scoring will continue to uh-huh. kind of remain high or at the clip that it's at when you look now we're just a day away from the start of the 2024-25 uh-huh. NHL season what are the storylines that you think will dominate this season in the NHL yeah um I mean, one of the unfortunate, sad ones is going to be just tracking what happens with Columbus all year. That's going to be a, that's going to be a heavy storyline, and that's going to be something that's going to be, that that that's that that's a big one. Um, I I think the I'm really in in, in the East. It's going to be, it's because you have a lot of teams who a lot of these teams that are on the rise and young and have these factors where you're like okay they're they're ready to be in they're ready to be in it's a uh, a buffalo a detroit you've got you've got these teams that are that are ready to be in you're like oh if, if i just in a vacuum that's a playoff team now but mm-hmm. other than the capitals who were got smoked in the playoffs last year who's gonna fall out what how are, how does that work with new jersey effectively fix the one like New Jersey is going to be back yeah. this New Jersey is mm-hmm. going to be back this year. Like the East to me, it's not necessarily, it's the, who is going to, there's going to be a surprise team. I don't know who. And cause also like Pittsburgh might be back in the chase too. Right. Like you hear like all this stuff about the, the revenge tour for Crosby and Malkin, but like, <laughs> so who is going to be the surprise team that made the playoffs last year 
that is going to sputter and fall out because it's going to happen, right? Like New Jersey and someone of Detroit or Buffalo or, or Pittsburgh is going to get it, right? So that means another yeah. team has to come out. So someone has to kind of sputter and, and fall out. The other big storyline that I just, just, and it's just a human one. And I, I don't think they're in the playoff picture yet, but the Utah story yeah. of p- players knowing that they can buy a house yeah. players knowing that they are playing in front of for playing for an ownership group that actually cares to <laughs> pay, pay their bills. Right. More than 5,000 seats. Ex- right? Exactly. <laughs> so like to me, I, I think Utah becomes a very um, pesky, intriguing. I think they're gonna be a much better team. I don't think they're a playoff team yet this year, just because you got to try and do that math of who comes yeah. out. But I think they become a much more, entertaining pesky team team that is like you know what this is this becomes one of those if i'm flipping through i might want to watch utah because they're also going to play they're going to play a little bit of an exciting style with the guys they've got there too so i i have a feeling that the market is really going to embrace them too Mm -hmm. like that hockey will be a success in salt lake city do you feel that way as well yeah i think so it's um i'll admit like when they first talked about salt lake city i hadn't done my research and it was I did the simple geography math and you're like, well, how is yeah. that? But you kind of, you talk to people and you, and you kind of, I've, I've talked to people. I've talked to Dominic Moore, who's now uh, part of their, their broadcast crew recently about kind of what it's like to kind of get going there. And it's, it's kind of a, it is such a natural outdoor weather city. Hockey kind of lends itself to that clientele. And it is, it is a, uh, it, it sets up like, I, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a really good success. I, I, yeah, I do, they really so I embrace the jazz. Like the NBA team, they they are fantastic about you know how they support the team there, and I think that they've been hungry for yeah. another, whether it be an MLS team or Major League Baseball team, or now getting the NHL. And then I think you hit on the head too that uh, once they figure out their arena issues, I saw something today about. <laughs> The sight lines are going to be uh, pretty terrible yeah. this year, yeah. but yeah. Uh, you know, well, uh, there. Yeah, there's. I mean, you got to. It's it's the whole thing. It's a line about that is there's there's four thousand like seats with like rough views, but there's eight thousand seats with just three thousand more seats than people. <laughs> there's eight thousand seats with really good views. That's yeah. three thousand more than we're at that games in Arizona. So. <laughs> Do you think that the OV watch will be kind of a, a huge story throughout the year? Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I just hope it has, I hope it doesn't feel forced on us. Like there's mm-hmm. like, I, like there's, there's times where it's kind of the way the capitals have approached this. Like whether you agree or disagree with how Pittsburgh has run things, everything with, within the Crosby Malkin window always feels like, Hey, it is towards, trying to win another cup it's not yeah. necessarily whether you agree with the move or not at least there's the you feel the that's the attempt in washington as much as they say the right things and, and like that but it's it's a lot of it feels like the ovechkin goal chase to me is kind of superseded a bit of the capitals having team success like it's and so i i think it's we're gonna see it a lot we're gonna have the storyline i mean if he's at the point where what he needs 48 this year. So like if he's got, if he has that hot start to the year where it looks like it, then all of a sudden maybe it becomes a nice natural thing. I just, I don't want it to become this thing where we're kind of slim. We're kind of pulling it into we're in game 60 and he's somehow still 20 away or something like mm-hmm. that. And it starts like becoming like, so I, I hope it is, it becomes a natural story because that would be more fun. But when, if you get forced and the capitals are, and he's just out there and he, and he really has lost a bit it becomes a little bit sad. So I don't want, I just don't want that version of it. <laughs> you don't want 30 of the last 48 goals to be empty. Netters. Empty netters. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 We don't want that. We don't want that. So. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about rookies a little bit. Cause that's a huge thing that drives yeah. the hobby. And there's a pretty good crop of rookies this year. Who in your mind is, has a chance to stand out and make a splash in the NHL this year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a couple, the, the two obvious ones to me that would just like right, right off the bat are Mitch is going to be fascinating, right? Mitch comes over. He's going to, he's going to play for, he's going to be with, he's going to be with Philly and he's going to, 
He's he's going to be a good player. Like he's he's fun to watch. Um, yeah, he didn't want to get in a fight yesterday. That's yeah, why he won't yeah. get injured yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I I love the. I, I, they're going to get caved in because the team around them is rough. Yeah. But like but like Cele, <laughs> but like Celebrini and Smith in San Jose to me that's a fun like that's a fun yeah. one two to watch. Mm-hmm. Like it makes them worthwhile and interesting. And um, the um, the one who like I'm just two other ones that kind of pop to me the first one is um like i think i I like the way anaheim's building a lot of stuff like i i'm a big i think leo i love what they did with leo carlson last Mm -hmm. year i'm a big believer that it's going to pay off in the long run because the plan Mm -hmm. they kind of took with him is going to work well um i really like what they've got with mintikov there like i really like the way anaheim is building a lot of things and like so i think gochi has a really good chance to kind of step in and actually have some success right like step in and play and then the other one and i don't know and you guys can maybe I, i'll flip it on you real quick card wise i don't know exactly how this would work for like a logan stankoven I, he's still technically a rookie this year he's still yeah, he's called their eligible and his yeah, yeah. young guns will be out in a couple weeks in series one so okay, he could yeah. be he'll probably be the big yeah yeah series crazy, one right? rookie chase and okay. yeah, he's very yeah. very intriguing as well and and so how, how do you compare him in like the Celebrini Will Smith vein? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think Stankoven may will probably have a better year this year because he's 21 years old playing for a team that is going to be one of the best teams in the West. Yeah. That's, that's like the Stankoven will have a better, will have a better year this year as a rookie. I think that's, if you were to, to kind of, Look at all. Then it's just that's the, that's the environment they're in. Um, he's also what the sixth or seventh option. Like if you're going in building, like <laughs> if, if, like if you're going in against a game against Dallas as a coach, and you're talking about, oh, we got to watch out for Jason Robertson, Rope Hints, Wyatt Johnston, uh, Matt Duchesne, we, we, it, it, all of those. You, you're getting. He's he's not San Jose. They San Jose Smith and Celebrini. The whiteboard will be up there, and their names will be circled eighty-two games a year this mm-hmm. year. So they're they're going to they're going to. They're going to get it rough. Uh, Stankoven is going to, I think Celebrini is going to be, to me, he's, uh, we need to think of a better word than generational. He's not generational. He's not that, but like, we need the word that's like, you know what? This guy is a really, this guy has a chance to be a bona fide number one for a long time. And I think he will be a number one center. And that's, and that's, mm-hmm. and that's like Celebrini. And, and I think Stankoven is going to be that guy who, because he's going to play for a really good team for a lot of his career. He's probably going to flirt with 40 something goals. It's, it's, it's not going to be uncommon to think of him as a 40 goal guy. And he's also going to be a guy who a little bit smaller is going to be a little bit Pat Verbeek like in the way he, the way he plays and uses his leverage and his body and everything mm-hmm. like that. And I think he's going to be a guy who is going to be part of a really good team for a long time, but he's never going to be the, circle on the marquee the way a Celebrini or even a Mitch Cox. So Celebrini might have a little bit more upside. Yes. But yeah. Stankovin is in a better position to have yes. maybe more production this, this year. This, this year. During the yeah, with yeah. So it's yeah. Do you do you have like a Calder favorite right now? Um I mean I think Stankovin is does is is a pretty has pretty and it's has a pretty good look at that just because of he played well like it's one of the weird things about the, the the Calder Trophy race and the voting, and it's like, and um, I didn't have a vote this past year. I've had a vote before. It just kind of it rotates around sometimes with PHWA stuff. Um, it's you narratives drive things so much and it kind sure. of and, and build mm-hmm. into things, right? And so this year, um, this this year coming in, like Stankoven had will have a bit of the the boost where he's no he's going to be on voters and writers radar from October because he's not new. He played last year in the playoffs. They saw him. So he's going to have a little bit of that. I I think there's, there's an opportunity for that with him to be interesting. I mean, I would, but it's hard not to like, if Mitch can go and have, a the year we think he might and the guys at elite prospects are pretty other the guys who are the scout guys who are even nerdier than i about this stuff and they're (laughs) proud of it they're very proud of it they see him as kind of this guy who can do 
can, can do some things similar to maybe what some other big name guys have done in, in, in their rookie year. I think Mitch Goff is a good kind of, Hey, that's a favorite right now of, yeah. Of, yeah so you have to worry about the torts factor there though. Yes. And no, I think, um, I, I do think there is a bit of the proper handling from flyers management from the top where they are all in on this Mitchkov plan. They've built everything mm-hmm. kind of, kind of around him. And um, I mean, it's, they were willing to wait when they drafted him uh, uh, not this past year, but the year prior, they kind of had the cloak and dagger type visit with him at their, at their, mm-hmm. at their yeah. practice at their. And so I, I think there will be, there will inevitably be at some point, whether it's game six or game 16 or 30 or 60, like there will be a hubbub in Philadelphia because Mitch Kov missed an assignment and didn't play for 10 minutes or that will happen. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. like, like, like that will happen. I think it's not something that's going to completely derail to rail him though, because I think part of the reason torts, and the and is I think him and Briere and Keith Jones I think there very much is a same page we're not going to mess this kid up philosophy gotcha. so okay, I, I want to hit back I, yeah it could I mean all of a sudden he could he could be playing fourth line minutes in game five and we could be here <laughs> all that but I, <laughs> we're sitting in the press box but, <laughs> yes. um, I want to go back to Dallas again real quick yeah. so one of the things that really is uh, just I don't know if interesting is the right word it's just sort of a fact in the hobby is that there's kind of usually like one big hobby chase per team and it's typically the primary goal scorer Uh or the guy who's got the most like flair or hype or popularity however you want to term that and to me dallas is a very interesting team and that you've got j rob who's still relatively young but you know there's questions like does he disappear is he as aggressive does he assert himself enough and then you have wyatt johnston you have stankovin some people really like Maverick Bork that could maybe. And so two, three years, four years, maybe down the road in your mind right now, who's the guy in Dallas? Do you think of, of that group? Um, well, from a hobby perspective, I mean, from, from a team building perspective, it's going to be Miro Heishkinen's team for the next forever I, from a, from a on ice perspective, but I, um, but Probably like from, the goal scorer. Yeah. Like yeah. Who's yeah. The... Um, to me, it's uh, why Johnson's a stud. Like why Johnson, I think that is the um, him and Maddie Beneers to me are a really good case study. Um, like I used the phrase earlier when it comes to goaltending, where it's like you learn the league, but the league learns you. Maddie Beneers had a really good kind of rookie year, had a bit of a yeah. sophomore slump because everyone knew what he was going to do. Wyatt Johnson got better from year one to year two. And yes, once again, environment comes into play and he plays for a better team. But to me, the way Wyatt Johnston manipulates space, the way he, um, the way he does so many simple things, right. And the way that he also just uses turn actually turns instant defense into offense within his game. That to me is like, he is going to be the, kind of model the stars will be built around the whole time like that's kind of like i I, that that to me is he's going to be the guy he's going to be the face um i think robertson is always going to be a goal scorer is always going to Mm -hmm. be that but like jason robertson is like it's easy for people with with from a star's perspective to think about how things work from 99 like like when they when they won the whole cup right then and so like i've made this comparison before because it's and now you're comparing to Hall of Famer, so it's not the greatest thing. But, like, Jason Robertson is very Brett Hull-esque where you could watch a game and you could be go, like, 45 minutes and think, oh, Jason Robertson's playing in this game. And then he could score twice in a span of 30 seconds. <laughs> and, he, yeah. and, that, and that's his impact. And that's where Robertson is, where, to me, Johnson is going to be someone who, whether it's the points, whether it's the overall play, he's the guy who this team is going to be built around him in the long run. And, and, and especially because he's also going to be, he's also healthier than Rope Hintz. Rope Hintz is just a, the way Rope Hintz puts his body through and like, he plays mm-hmm. like a, a man, like not possessed, like chaos, like, like <laughs> the Tasmanian devil. He's Johnston becomes more and more to me of that reliable number one. C. you show up every night and you're going to be like, that's the guy I show up to watch. So. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so I, I know that you're in Detroit, and yeah. I'm just kind of thinking of guys that yeah. have had a lot of hobby interest. Uh, Lucas Raymond had a really nice jump last year. Yeah. Is there more upside to his game? I think do so. You think? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think. Um, I don't. I don't think we're you're going to see like a, a, a meteoric rise, but like I do think consistency is going to start to come into play a little bit more. I think there's going to be. You could probably look at if, if asking for. 10, 12 more points this year. And then kind of that seeing where that goes. I, I think that's, that's a fair bit more expectation of he's like, so yeah, I think that's, that that's fair with Raymond. I mean, Detroit's mm-hmm. an inter- Yeah. Detroit's an interesting team. And I, I guess I'll just, it's because some of the like young guys they're building around. And this is, I guess more almost flipping it back on you guys talking about it. It's like, it's mm-hmm. guys just, I see from a card, from a hobby perspective where it's like, more side, Mo Sider's a great player. Simon Evanson's a great player, but they're not. But they're effectively defensemen who are not going <laughs> to. They're not Kale McCarr, which exactly, is fine. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, like, yeah. it's like very similar here, where you know we have a guy here in Minnesota, uh, Brock Faber, who's yeah, awesome, yes, and I'm yeah. so happy. But people want to make him a hobby star, and I love the guy, and I'm so happy. I think he'll be the captain of the Wild someday. I'm very confident mm-hmm. of that. But he, you can go back to when he was eight years old, he's never scored 10 goals yeah. in a season in his life. And it's yeah. so to expect him to be Kale McCarr scoring 30 goals. It isn't going to happen. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's, you know, and it's like the, the guys, you know, is the goalies are tough too. And it's like, if you want to be a, a like a quote unquote, like investable or chase defenseman, you got to have that major up, offensive upside to your game like we yeah. see with Hughes and McCarr and then there it seems like there's a very large drop off after that yeah yeah it yeah, just kind of comes yeah it's interesting that way like it's it's what what's what the value it's hard to it doesn't fit doesn't fit super pretty on the back of a hockey guard sometimes so no 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 100% <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about comeback candidates yeah. because that, you know, players trajectories are not always a straight line and you got guys yeah. that uh, come out of the gate real strong and then stumble a little bit and, and come back. And a guy who is, we kind of asked everyone this, so, so I'm really yeah. curious to get your, Troy knows where I'm going yeah. to get your, your feedback is uh, his rookie year. The hobby went real hard after Trevor Zegras. Mm-hmm. Where do you stand on him now? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Does he need out? Does he need uh, out of Anaheim? Like move out, go somewhere else. I don't know if he needs to be moved out, but I do think that's a question that that Pat Verbeek and Greg Cronin need to answer rather quickly because yeah. I think I think there is a um like I said earlier, I like how that team is built. I like there's there's some other teams who, if you were to say, could I get some of Anaheim's pieces versus theirs, you would pick Anaheim. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them, just between um, between Carlson, Mintikov, um, between uh, just kind of where all of that's going. Um, I, I I I think that Zegris is going to be. I think the best path personally, now this is just my opinion. I think the best path personally for the ducks is to move Zegras now to get something to kind of build around to, to let mm-hmm. the core be built around the Carlson's, the Gauthier's, the, that kind of group that's there right now, because it's. What's, well, what's, it's, what's the issue with him? Now, I, I, I don't, this is not going to be scientific at all. So I apologize for this answer being as it is, but it's, <laughs> there, there are certain times where just having to be the guy as the first rounder, having to be the guy who has the flash and having the expectation of that team. And then once you get surpassed, the player just kind of feels a little bit discarded. Like there's a huge, there's an emotional part mm. of this. Like, like when I was in Dallas, just to give like a human example of it, like um, John Klingberg before Miro Heishkin was drafted, John Klingberg's one of the things John Klingberg was very proud, open defenseman about how he wanted to be, you know, he thought he could be one of the best defensemen in the world. He thought he could win a Norris trophy. Stars draft Miro Heishkin and come in and it becomes very hard to be in the best defenseman in the NHL conversation. If you are, the second best defenseman on your own team, right? So no. that becomes a, and so 
Zegers has a bit of the personality where he is the showman. He is the star. And that's great. I think it's great for the game, but it's also something mm-hmm. where he is very similar to um, the way for me. Um, now let's, I want to be very clear when I say this, just because Val Nichushkin is the, the off ice things that Nichushkin's dealing yeah. with separate, yeah. are completely different. But we saw Nichushkin left Dallas, left an organization where he had all these expectations and everything. Things got he got he effectively got the restart and really became a just a dynamic player. Mm-hmm. And I, I think Zegras I think Zegras is kind of just a case of that where sometimes for whatever reason it doesn't mean that it was bad the entire time, but at some points it's time for, sometimes it's for time for a team and a player to separate because that's probably the best for both. And that's the way I look at Anaheim right now. Because I think Zegras still could be I think he could be that dynamic guy, that guy you want to watch every night. I just hmm. think it might have to be somewhere else. Is it a maturity thing? I think it's just a, I think it's partially a maturity thing, partially an expectations thing. And sometimes, okay. and sometimes guys, there's an entire like generation of hockey players right now. And that's, it's just the reality. And this isn't picking mm-hmm. on anyone in particular, but it's very, they've been the number one guy forever and they don't really ever get humbled on things. Right. And so there's yeah. Yeah. sometimes, I, I think some t- there's some players who have naturally been able to handle that. Some others, it takes a bit of adversity into their career before they they find mm-hmm. the right fit. So, uh, another guy the hobby went nuts for going back. Uh, so it would have been January 2023 when Cole Caulfield got injured. I believe at the time he was pacing for 45 goals. You're in Montreal, and it doesn't yeah. get any more. Uh, you know, yeah. The, the passionate than that and that and they're the most passionate probably collect fans in the hobby and collectors in the hobby and you know one of the things sean that was kind of amazing about that experience is typically when a guy gets hurt like that the market takes a huge hit because you're out of yeah. sight out of mind his market just grew and grew and grew because i think people were focused on holy cow this guy was pacing for 45 goals yeah before he got hurt and then you know last year i'm sure there's a little bit of you know, when you're coming back from knee surgery, it's not like you feel 100% or back to your old self right away. And he didn't have a bad year, but, you know, it was like I think high 20s, low 30s in production, yeah. something like that. What do you see from him this year? Do you see kind of a bounce back to that that pace he was on or form that he was looking? Or, you know, what do you, what do you think of him overall as a player? Yeah, I mean, I think the the kind of like – the 40, I know, like the pace for 45 goals. Like I look at Caulfield as a little bit more of like, Hey, he's going to be that, that point per game guy. Like, I don't know if he, I don't yeah. know if it's going to be a, a 40, like to me, I think he profiles a little bit more on the way he plays and the way he creates. I, I think he profiles a little bit more as like a 35 goal, 50 assist type guy. To me, that's kind of a little yeah. bit more of the realistic Mm-hmm. way he plays and like it, having seen how he creates for others like now that that year he had the uh, i don't have a shooting percentage in front of me but i think he went in a little <laughs> bit of a shooting 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 percentage bender that year i um he also there was yeah so you're right I, last year I, he was yeah yeah so like I, I i think he's i think he i think he becomes that point per game guy i think as he He's kind of one of those guys where I think his game is going to get better. He's actually one of the fascinating things for me with Marty St. Louis as a coach because I think Marty St. Louis is a really good player development guy. Like, I think he's really mm-hmm. good at helping individuals take the mm-hmm. next step. I think we've seen, I think we've seen a lot of that on an individual level. And we've heard about that. I don't know about Marty St. Louis as an actual team coach. Like, that's kind of one of the, like, that, yeah. that's been kind of one of the weird things with watching Montreal for me is they're building these individual pieces and they've been working on that. The Caulfields, the Slavkovskis, they've been getting, trying to kind of build them up, but the team has yet to kind of find an identity beyond a bunch of guys trying to take next steps. And so um, I think Caulfield, I think Caulfield on a personal level will take the next step. Like, I think he's a point per game guy. I think that's realistic. I don't know about with Montreal is kind of a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole, a whole nother, whole nother thing to figure out. So, yeah. As a hockey card journalist, like we like to pretend we are, we're contractually obligated to now talk about Bedard Palooza and Connor Bedard. <laughs> yes. Yes. Has dominated the hobby to an unprecedented degree this year. Everyone's kind of gone nuts 
for this kid. I, I basically have two questions kind of that we've asked a lot of people too. Yeah. It's like, what is his ceiling and, and what do you expect out of him this year? That's a, the ceiling's a really good question. Let's say like, 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 like is he going to be an Austin Matthews type impact player in the NHL or is he going to be a little bit below that? It's hard to. Yeah. I mean, he's, to me, I, I, I think he's like, I, I think he's better. Like, I, th- I think there's a, like, it's easy for people to go the Connor Connor comparison, right? Like it's like best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. best and, and I think it's a disservice. They have very different to, games though. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, it's, but... and I, I also think it's a bit of a disservice to what McDavid's done already. Like, I think we over, I think mm. we downplay how good Connor McDavid is. Like, I think mm. it's, I think we kind of give where people, we put people in the tier of like, Oh, he could be like a Connor McDavid. And that's, that's, that's not fair. That that's, that's us underselling how good McDavid is. Like no one else to me in the NHL, do you, hockey is such a, such a team game and individual, but McDavid to me is the only player where you're like, my team's winning three, nothing in the third period. But the second his, the puck touches his stick, I feel like my team's about to lose, right? Like that to me is like even in a team sport. So I don't think putting Bedard anytime anyone does that, I feel a little bit like, I think that's an unfair to the work and and what McDavid has become already as a player. Mm. The, if you were saying Bedard versus a Matthews type player, like I think Bedard has, I I think I, I, I would put, I would put Bedard over Matthews, like in the long term projection wow. on that. That would be, mm. I, I think it's a. Now I, I think Matthews is Matthews may end up with the higher goal scoring season between them and their two careers, sure. but I think, but I think Bedard will create a little bit more. So I kind of look at it that way. Um, to me, the impact that Bedard has had, and I'm just really interested to see. Like his is well, and this is maybe this is something that you know durability is part of greatness, right? Like so, yeah. his durability is going to be interesting because he is not a big kid. He even as he gets bigger, there's only it's not like he's going to get much taller. Like it, right now, his shot, the way he um, the way he pulls the way he, he pulls it in and gets that release within about six inches. That's unique right now, effectively, yeah. right? Like we're seeing it more and more, but like that's effectively. But unique. every eight-year-old in the world is doing exactly, it. Though, ex- right? Exactly. No, like yeah, like I talked to, uh, I talked to Cole Eiserman quite a few times um, at the national team program last season. He talked about how he was basically just copying Bedard's shot and working on yeah. learning it. So, so like Bedard is going to get to this spot to me where he's teams are going to play him very physical. That's going to be the playbook. Yep. It's fitting. He's in, he's fitting. It's fitting. He's in Chicago. You had the Jordan rules, right. From a, from a yep. basketball perspective, you're going to have something like that from a hockey perspective. Mm. And, and Bedard isn't playing in an era where teams have someone to go protect him. And I'm not a big, like, I, I believe me, I'm not a big, like go drop the gloves fight guy, but we always hear the stories from Gretzky himself talking about how he got more space because guys would, wouldn't, wouldn't beat me up and yeah. Bedard is going to play is have that. So I like, he is going to be a great, a great player. I don't think like I, I would put him above Matthews with just kind of right now looking where it goes, but I just, I have so much respect for McDavid's game. So anytime anyone brings the Connor yeah. Connor comparison, yeah. it just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem fair to me for what McDavid really is. Like sometimes we need to recognize greatness that mm. is in front of us and not and not take it not not bring anyone else down but just put put people on the put people put things in the tier where they should be so do you think some like 35 goals and 90 points is realistic for bedard this year this year yeah i think so i, I think i think that's I, I think 30 35 goal yeah 35 goals 90 points i think i think that's a realistic i think that's a realistic spot um the Blackhawks should be a little bit better. <laughs> so it's like, that's, that's, that's the, that's the other thing where he's going to be someone who from a point perspective and as things go, like as the, as the, as they get better pieces around him and people that can actually finish a bit more, his numbers are going to get better. Cause he's going to have from the yeah. setup and the space he creates. So that's the thing where is he uh, like, he'll probably, he'll be a hundred point guy within the next couple seasons. I don't think it'll be this year, but I think he'll be a hundred point guy in the next couple seasons or so. So. 
one more hockey question, then we're going to get into the late yep. game. And I, I got to ask cool. just because you're in Denver. So one of the there's a lot of weird stuff in the hockey hobby world. Uh, one of those is or one thing that nobody seems to understand, and I want to see if you could find a reason or make sense of it, is by and large, the hobby doesn't seem to care about Nathan McKinnon. <laughs> and and if, so if I were to tell you that and ask you why, well, what would you think the answer would be? Because we can't figure it out. I, so I, I wasn't aware that the hobby didn't care that much about Nathan McKinnon, but that's... that's, that's, I, that's I, I mean, it's, it's not like he... But he's like on a... So if you look at like the, yeah. the hobby tiers, yeah, that like the top tier would be your Crosby, Ovechkin, McDavid, Matthews, and probably Bedard, right? Okay. Just because of the hype factor. And then you go down to tier two, where you have like your Jack Hughes is maybe borderline tier one, Pasternak, and McKinnon type. But but it seems almost given how good of a hockey player Nathan McKinnon is to yeah. not be on that same hobby level as a McDavid or a Matthew no, that's, yeah. or Crosby. It, it seems almost like uh, it's, it's a crime against hockey. And I just, <laughs> and I just don't know if yeah. there's something about his personality or his approach to the game or the market or how, if, if you could yeah. find any explanation in that. Yeah. I don't, it's interesting because like for me, McKinnon is the um, like, I, McKinnon to me is like Mario Lemieux, right? Where it's, you have the, you have guys who you watch and you know, they're brilliant and it's the, and it's the way they think the game and everything like that. But McKinnon, like I remember as a kid, even on the, on far from the HD television we see now, you would watch the moon. You're like, this guy is just not from this planet, right? The way, the way that with the size and the speed and the, and the combination of all that, you're like, this is not supposed to make sense. And that's, what McKinnon is too, where it's like, he's the guy who, like I talked about McDavid being that guy just with the speed and you're like, Oh, we're going to lose. But like McKinnon is very much to me, like watching Marilyn Lemieux when I was a kid, just like he is that much of a force in, in various ways. Is, is he the closest in skill to McDavid of any player in the NHL? Um, I would say he's the closest in being able to activate that skill at that speed to McDavid. Hmm. I think, I think that's, I think, because okay. I, I think, I think a, a ton of, there's it's such a skilled league and there's, there's so much on that, but to be able to activate, play at yeah, 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 yeah. To play at that pace, to be able to basically be going F1 car speeds is yeah. to, to do that. That to me is what McKinnon does is he's the only one who's even close to McDavid on, on, on that level. Um, and no, you're right. I don't, I don't get why he's not, it, it maybe and maybe it's just because of the. It, it might be because there's. It might be the market. It might be, mm-hmm. be the fact that. Just from a. He went through and, and I don't know maybe people I don't know if it's I don't I don't think it's fair if people hold it against him too but like. He went through a time where the team sucked. The team was one of the worst teams yeah. in in the in the NHL, and yeah, he wasn't I like shot out of a cannon as far as yeah. his hype. It's like he had to his career had to build a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I do wonder too, just from a collecting perspective, and this is, would be more of your expertise, so I don't know, but like I do wonder if like you mentioned like a Crosby, a McDavid, like uh, they or a Hughes right? or or whatever, like any of those guys, like if they win the cup, they're going to be number one, right? Like it's going to be like yeah. the, the mm-hmm. magazine cover is going to have them on the cover. If the avalanche win the cup, Kale McCarr's name typically comes up first and that's nothing yeah. against And Like, and so I just wonder from a perspective of if McCarr gets a little bit too much, not too much credit. He's a tremendous player, top one of the best players in the world. Right. But like, I wonder if there's times where you look at where, McKin the narrative around McKinnon becomes McCarr had to come in for the Avalanche to become what they yeah. did, which mm. is also not necessarily fair to what McKinnon did before that when the team was 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 well. There's like the baby so, Bobby yeah. Orr thing with McCarr, yeah. right? Where not yeah. since Bobby Orr have we seen yes, this sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. So yeah. Very, very very interesting. Okay, before we yeah. let you go, we got to talk a little bit about your experience. Uh, <laughs> You were Nick the Tendy in the late game yes. movie. So how did that come about? Yeah, so uh, 
my good friend uh, Jeff Jeff Tyner wrote and directed it. Uh, we went to uh, him and I both went to Bowling Green uh, Bowling Green State University in Ohio, and that's that's where we met. And we met through uh, we met through play in like a it was a random pickup. We became friends because it was a my sophomore year of college. It was a random drop in. And me and Jeff were the only two people that showed up. Like so it was the only two people that showed up for a drop in. Now, uh, now I'm I'm a goalie. I'm, I'm a goalie. He's a shooter, so it worked out well. And we became friends because like we just we became friends from that. And so he went and wrote the movie The Late Game um, during during COVID actually. And he was uh, as he was looking to cast things out, he wanted to. They needed a real actor. They needed someone with actual expertise in the lead role and in, in, in the main character's role. And so, the 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 lead, Alec Resch, is um, <laughs> he is he's a real actual actor. Is I believe he was. Yeah, he did a great job. LA, and, yeah, he did a great job. And but the other, the rest was let's cast people who know beer league and we can teach them to act a little bit. So it yeah. was the it was kind of that we it, that way we don't have to fake. The hockey. We don't have to fake like the movie the, Miracle. They wanted hockey exactly, players first, and exactly. then they'll teach them back. <laughs> exactly. So it was it was kind of that where it was Jeff was like, "Hey, I want you to play goalie in it. I don't need you to. You you. It's just got to be yourself." And that's kind of. Um, and a lot of guys in the movie actually had their name the same in the yeah. movie, like a uh, Tyler. Like, uh, um, I actually made the decision to like so when. I signed on to do the movie. Jeff asked me um, if I wanted to have my name in the movie or not. And I actually didn't. I wanted to play because I wanted to be able to, I wanted to be played a slightly exaggerated version of myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't like, I didn't want to have to be playing myself. I wanted to play to some of the goalie stereotypes that are necessarily Nick the goalie in the movie. And I'm not that like, like there's like in the scene, like where, the Riley joins the meets the team and they're in the locker room and uh, hmm. and I'm just in my own zone and completely ignoring everything. <laughs> We're being a weird that, goalie, right? Like exactly. the stereotype. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's playing into the stereotype a little bit. I'm very yeah. I'm a very social person in general. Like so there's yeah. so I, I I it was kind of it came to we shot shot the movie over two weeks in Charleston, South Carolina. It was it was a blast and it was um it was kind of one of those things where for me, like I like from a to kind of be part of my favorite, like it's a comedy and it's funny and it's hilarious and people should watch it. The thing that I'm really proud of is I know when when Jeff sat down to write it and cast it, one of his goals was I want the hockey action to be the most believable hockey action since Miracle because so much mm-hmm. hockey content is made where you're like, yeah, that wasn't made by people who either understood the sport or no. anything like that. And so I'm incredibly proud when I watched that part where I'm like, this is, you actually feel like you are in the beer league game. This isn't, you're, you're not taken mm. out of the store. If you're a hockey fan, you're not taken out of the story because the on ice product is crap. So <laughs> were you intimidated about the acting part though? Not ever having done it before. Um, I think I had a little bit more. Com- I have a little bit of comfort on camera. I've done things like I've done. Sure. I've done. I've done stuff for NHL Network before. I've done things mm. for. So I've done like now reporting, right? Like it was very yeah. for me the most difficult thing, and it just like it took me a f- the first two days of shooting to get it right. Was I'm so used to the media journalism part of this where you look at the camera, right? Yeah. That is yeah. that is one of the things when you are in a movie. You are not supposed to be <laughs> staring at the camera. So there was um, on the first the first two days of shooting, there was way too many times that I'd like to admit where they had to where, where there was a cut because I was looking at the camera and and not. So that was my biggest adjustment, and it was and it was good because we shot uh, one of the first things we did when we shot it too was we shot some of the the B roll for mm. hockey right away where we just yeah. basically we just went out there basically we had the, the camera was rolling we would set it up it was like okay hey this is a play in the poly zone it's going to be a face-off win just play guys and for me kind of having that um intro point where it's like oh like 
that that really kind of it wasn't like jumping straight into a set of like now yeah, you, you have, have to, to ease into yeah, it yeah, a little bit. Yeah, you got mm-hmm. to ease it got to ease into it and, and so that that to me was a big thing. Now um it was uh it's it's still like surreal to me at times where like I was we were at my wife and I were out to dinner the other night with someone and we were talking and it brought up like that, that I was in a movie and I'm like, it's, it's still kind of like weird to me. Like, yeah. it's still like kind of like weird where it's like, like, yeah, I, I acted in a movie. I still, yeah. have a hard, I still have a hard time believing myself when I say that because like, yes, I acted in a movie, but we made a really awesome fun beer league movie. Like, have you been recognized yet on the street? Are they like, Hey, are you the guy that was yeah. in that? <laughs> no, 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 not on the street. Uh, I, have, I, have, I haven't had that. No, I've had the, I did have the, I have had the interaction where I've talked to people like, I was rec- wasn't recognized for it, but it's been kind of cool to like I've either subbed in another beer league game or like skated on like a Friday night and mm-hmm. talk to some people and bring up the movie and someone's already seen it. Like that's always, that's, 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 awesome. always, that, that's always the cool part to me. Are you going to Toronto in November to the expo? That is my plan. I, um, I've got the, uh, luckily for me, it's a, about a three, three, a three and a half hour drive, depending on the time of day. Oh yeah. Yeah. Through Detroit. Yeah. yeah right so, you. So that is that. That's that's my plan. I don't know my exact travel time schedule because I know, like, I think it's a show that yeah. goes what Wednesday to Sunday or Thursday to Sunday. Thursday, or Friday, yeah. Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So I know I'm gonna make the trip for part of it. I just don't know whether I'm doing four days, two days. I, I have to figure out the the exact uh, stuff on that. But I the, the, there will be planning. I'm planning on doing it. So one of the exhibitors at the show. Who just sits there and sells his stuff is our, always Marcel Dion. So okay, <laughs> uh, it's pretty wild. And, and uh, it'll be great to hopefully meet up with you and get your. Uh, we call it hockey card heaven because it's <laughs> yeah. it's all 80, 90 percent hockey, and that's cool. Yeah. It's uh so can't wait to to see you there. Well, hey Sean, thank you so much. You've been super generous with your time. And where can people? Uh, follow listen read yeah, anything yeah. that you're doing yeah i mean i it's i put every quick quickest way is where everything goes is i still have everything on, on twitter at sean shapiro that's the that's the simplest where everything is but check out check out stuff for elite prospects if you're in the hockey world it's hard to not check out elite prospects honestly just sometimes <laughs> you, you google you, you get curious about a player you end up there um but just for me it's the big one is uh that I like to push people to just when on projects like this is my own personal passion project over at the Substack. It's shapshotshockey.com. And that's the, uh, and just for me, it's that that's the place, as I kind of said earlier, that's where I get to be a nerd and dive into things. I can, and just kind of look at all these, look, look, look at, look at things like the, like we said, like, what's it like to be an offhand winger to like, mm-hmm. to like, like that's kind of, to me, that's the passion project. And that's kind of the, the big one that I would uh, push people towards. So. All right, Sean. Well, we hope to talk to you again soon. And uh, thank you again for taking the time today. That was a blast. Happy to do it. <laughs> All right. Well, that was an awesome conversation. Again, thanks thanks to Sean. And check. make sure to check out his sub stack at Shapshots. S-H-A-P-S-H-O-T-S. And then, of course, the Late Game movie on Amazon Prime in the U.S. and Apple in Canada. So uh, thoughts about our conversation with Sean Troy? Yeah, I mean, it was. Oh, hold on. What did you say his website was? Shap Shots is his. Shap, shaps, shots, hockey.com. Okay. Right. Got to put the hockey in there. So you, we don't know what you're going right. to go to if you don't go to. <laughs> but yeah, no. <laughs> you go to some weird site. Yeah, don't, like, don't blame us, man. We didn't do it. Uh-huh. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, wealth of knowledge. These guys, I don't know how they retain all that information. It's also nice. He's got. I mean, he's got knowledge of the whole league, but also specifically, we you know we got we got bogged down, talk, or not bogged down. That sounds like bad, but we dove into a little bit about Red Wing guys and Dallas Stars guys. Who he has, he lives in Michigan, right? He lives in yeah the area, I think, and was a beat writer for the Stars. So, and I will say this: I, I brought it up in the interview. Check out his site because he does write on stuff that is different than what you see everywhere. That's one of the yeah. things when you start reading a lot of media. It's almost the same stories get regurgitated over and over, which is one of the reasons I like the athletic because they do some different stuff. But his site that shaps shot hockey.com. I hope I'm saying that right. He does like I bring it up in the interview where he talks about playing on the off wing and why is that beneficial to people? It's articles like that that I really look like I really like. And he goes into a lot of that stuff. 
You guys got to geek out about goalies for like 10 minutes too. Got to geek out about goalies. I got to talk about the my elite prospects page where I'm just listed as a coach. I didn't show it on the screen or anything. It's nothing really to see. It just says my name. <laughs> for the last five years, I've been goalie coach in Minnetonka. That's about all it shows. I love how these guys too, like when we're talking to them, they casually will like drop in. Yeah, I was talking to Patrick Kane the <laughs> yeah. other day. Like, Pat Kane was over at my house. We were just hanging out, having some beers, talking about the hockey, how about the league. Oh, I'm like, well, Sean, <laughs> I was talking to my Marco Casper card the other day. And he didn't say anything back, which is weird. Yeah, it's uh, kind of crazy that these guys are connected, and we're going to c- continue to have more and more of these yeah. type of people on our show because we just think it's uh, great news or great information. Well, it gives you like a, a little bit extra knowledge again on players and – if you're mm-hmm. really thinking hard about investing or yep. uh, playing the value game on, on some of the stuff that's out there in the aspects. Well, I like to like when almost they don't have tons of like hobby knowledge. So like you can take mm-hmm. like a guy who's got a lot of hobby momentum, like Wyatt Johnston and mm-hmm. say, is he the real deal? And they're not going to look at it through like the hobby lens. Yeah. They're going to look at it through that hockey lens. And, you know, I think which can inform your decisions or help mm-hmm. inform your decisions as collectors. So thanks again to Sean. Remember to check out a sub stack at slapshots hockey, shapshots hockey.com. And then of course the late game movie, Amazon prime in the U S Apple and Canada. Hobby news. Hobby news. Kind of a big story to start. Huh? <laughs> yeah, what? <sighs> wow. Holy moly. So I'm going to kind of run through the details on this. And it was the title of our show that, allegedly up to five hundred thousand dollars in redemptions were stolen from upper deck so they've yeah. sued a former employee of the company's redemption facility which is located in north carolina for ed- for allegedly stealing more than five hundred thousand dollars worth of redemptions got a lot of the info we're going to talk about at first from sports collectors yeah. daily so wanted to credit them for that the lawsuit fi- was filed about two weeks ago accuses adrian edward fronsack of civil liability for theft of an employee Upper Deck is also asking for an injunction to prevent him from selling any more of the alleged stolen property and would like any cards returned. <laughs> give, please give those back. All those cards you would like them back. <laughs> to pay restitution. Can Troy have his Pekka ready twisted tensile back, please? Well, he's refusing to return them, I guess. Like they stated that in the... Well, because he probably sold them all, right? Or gave them to friends or... The 28-year-old Franzak was hired just last May as an associate redemptions manager. <laughs> at the so he was hired and just immediately said, screw it, I'm going to go. So, like, he had a plan, right? It sounds like he uh-huh. had a plan to get hi- to get hired and go in and start wreaking I havoc. think so. Yeah. Yeah, so he starts at the North Carolina facility. And, of course, due to the nature of his job, he had access to, I think, what the Upper Deck termed in the lawsuit is like, quote, unquote, like loose cards yeah. that were either unfulfilled redemptions or replacement cards. Apparently, too, he also had access to other stockpiles of cards, like maybe that were to be shipped or packed out or something like that as well. You get into like, I saw, and if you get into this, stop. Nope, you do. I see it. Never mind. Okay. Keep going. So according to the lawsuit, he immediately began stealing cards after starting his job, which supports your sort of, I think he had some sort of plan going into it. Uh, Many were high value rookie autos, according to Upper Deck. Uh, Apparently went on for two months until Upper Deck actually received a tip that he was selling these stolen cards. So I don't think they caught him from their own internal measures. It doesn't sound like that, at least. Well, it sounds like Uh, there wasn't a lot of internal (laughs) measures. Personally, it was pretty lax. Upper Deck at that point launched an internal investigation, also contacted the Durham, North Carolina Police Department, yeah. who then arrested Fronsack on August 20th and charged him with felony embezzlement. And upon his arrest, uh, shockingly, Upper Deck terminated his employment. <laughs> Apparently, he w- he wasn't selling these cards on eBay or anything like that, but he was doing, I think, more private transactions. Pr- private transactions. And he was accepting money via PayPal, which was probably really stupid because that gets into like wire fraud, doesn't it? And stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, these people, like, you can't, I, not that I like sit there and think about this, but obviously you can't, anything online, they're going to be able to track you eventually. Now, maybe if you did it through like Bitcoin or some of the, one of those currencies, yeah. you could probably get around it. But when you use PayPal or any like reputable or established, not that Bitcoin's not reputable, it totally is, but I mean, you can get around things not using PayPal or whatever, but not that you would normally classify criminals as 
like typically smart. <laughs> so I guess it's not shocking in that regard. Apparently, Troy, one person bought 60,000 worth of cards for him. It was one of those PayPal transactions. Now, that's illegal, too, right? Like, if you know if you know buy... it's stolen, I think it's illegal to buy from him. OK, that's right. That, too. The court documents also state that he would either hide cards in his clothing or he would use Upper Deck's computer system. That's what I wanted to get to. Mail cards to himself. So he basically send redemptions to himself. And I guess that's how he got away with getting them out of the building. Now, it looks like Upper Deck has been able to account for at least 319 stolen cards with a value at 190,000 US. What cards are those? It's like, gosh, I have like 60,000 cards not worth 190,000 US. <laughs> Uh, but actually, they believe the total is a hundreds more and are valued at north of five hundred thousand dollars. I really I really hope because I want to find the I mean, I, I went out and I found like some of the pages. I want to see the whole lawsuit. But I think yeah. in the article you read, they say that they actually Upper Deck didn't didn't put a list of what cards. I hope this case gets going. I want to see all the cards that were stolen. Like, I, I would love to see that and see what what he took. Uh, yeah, and it is kind of funny that they demanded in return any unsold cards, and he refused. It seems kind of either brazen, or he didn't want to like admit maybe to the totality of what was stolen. Yeah. I, I don't know, but that's kind of crazy to me. Well, so that's the general scoop. Uh, it's a total mess. I'm sure that Upper Deck will use this opportunity to do an audit of their checks and balances yeah. and safety and protocols and processes as all this. But I do kind of feel bad for him, too, because, you know, I, it's a violation. You know, anytime you're like an employer and you hire someone and they are they do something illegal, you know, it's their fault. Right. And, and so I, I I'm in my mind, I have more empathy for upper deck in this case than not. And like I said, as long as I, I think if you're at the company and you really learn from something like this, because they're out a lot of money yeah. and that's got to hurt. And then the second thing that of course, I think what probably most people are thinking of right now is, well, what happens if one of my redemptions was one of these, how does upper deck make that right? Yeah, they should. I mean, I hope they make it right. I don't know how they're going to make it right, but it's going to probably take this might take a year or two years to get through the whole court system. If he doesn't plead guilty, yeah. that stuff's crazy. I, I still want to know if my twisted tinsel Becca Rene was in this lot because he wasn't going to make any money off that if he was going to try to no. sell it. But yeah, and you know, part of the series, like you said, review their checks and balances because it seems. And this is all anecdotal what they were saying in the articles like it seemed like the the systems they had in place seemed very lax for watching for this kind of stuff but then again if it's too strict people complain oh you're all you know you're on my back you're always stick like amazon we're tracking exactly where you're going to the bathroom and stuff like that but so that's kind of interesting and even with a good systems in place everyone or not everyone but if you haven't seen it go check out the i think it's netflix the McDonald's documentary yeah. uh, on the Monopoly game and how they had checks and balances and the person scamming that was still able to do get all the top prizes. So these criminals, they'll figure it out. I mean, there are smart criminals and they, they do figure stuff out like this, but I hope, I hope they get the cards back. I don't know what's going to happen. I hope I want to see a list of them and I hope they figure out a better system to prevent this from happening again. Cause it's really, it stinks. It's disheartening. Well, you're speculating about your P.E.K.K.A. I did a quick <laughs> math on my phone here. It looks like that uh, of the known cards, the average card value is like six hundred dollars. So nope. I'm pretty safe. <laughs> that ain't uh, P.E.K.K.A. <laughs> and that kind of indicates too that he knew what he was looking he knew what for. He was doing. Too, yeah. And mean people and criminals suck because it, <laughs> you know, it just means that a whole bunch of people aren't going to get the cards yeah. that they've been waiting a long time for so we'll definitely follow this and see what happens and if you guys mm -hmm. have opinions on it be sure to comment to us on social media or in the youtube comments etc we got actually a lot more to get to in hobby news and i didn't want to go forget to mention that it's opening week coming up here troy yep and there's a couple i just want to highlight very quickly some of the games of note so the 2024 
2025 NHL season kicks off Friday night, October 4th in Chechia, where the continuation of the NHL Global Series and the New Jersey Devils will take on the Buffalo Sabres. Now, I got to bring Louie in here real quick because he's repping his Devils. Uh, now, right. Berdur's kid is getting the start tonight in the preseason. Is that what I'm understanding? That's what I saw. I haven't looked to see if it came to fruition, but... Is he going to have a chance to make the team? I uh, I think Probably so. Not, huh? not this year. I don't think Markstrom's the guy. Huh? Oh yeah, he ain't playing. No. Okay. Is Berdur's kid supposed to be good? Have you heard anything about him, Troy? I actually have not heard anything about him, which is more probably an indictment of me than how good he is. I, I don't know. He just, had a kid until I saw he was starting tonight in goal for the. Yeah, I probably wasn't just paying devil. attention. So, it's kind of cool. Louis. A handful of, handful of years ago, what, two years ago? Maybe three, two? Uh, he was down at Shattuck. Well, oh, really? Watched him play down there, yeah. Okay, since you went there, since you went with the Minnesota angle, I'm going to go with the Minnesota angle, too. You see this, if you watch on YouTube, there's a graphic that Josh got for the Global Series. The sponsor is Fastenal. Winona. Winona, Minnesota, baby. I don't know why they're sponsoring it, but good for them. Yep. What do they do? What does Fastenal do? Louie? <laughs> is that, uh, um they so when you want to buy collection things of your teams like those fake license plates or pennants and flags and all that stickers they make all that stuff for the nhl yeah and they like oh. if, and basically you can buy anything ever you've ever wanted for your work right if you're like a mm -hmm. shop like an industrial shop they make everything screws gloves or i don't know if they make them but they're like oh you know have them Garbage cans, wrench sets. Oh, I mean, you know what? No, disregard what I just said. That was a complete line of BS. Um, <laughs> I was thinking of... Uh, Are you thinking like of the flowers? ice cream company? Are you thinking of... No, I don't want to run over there and get it. I'm thinking of a complete <laughs> different company. <laughs> all right, fast and all. Well, they make... It, just they, look make them up. they, they, make they have everything. I don't know if they make it or they're uh, a warehouse or a, what are we, a distributor. I, something like that, but... There's your 12 minutes on the sponsor. Of <laughs> we have just <laughs> talked the last 15 minutes on Fast and All, based in yes. Winona, Minnesota. Based in Winona. So on Friday, we're going to have the Devils take on the Sabres. That would be a, actually a fun one to watch. Sponsored and by then, Fast and All. Uh, sponsored by Fast and All. And then on <laughs> Tuesday, October 8th, the season really kicks off in earnest, earnest in North America with a number of uh, pretty good matchups, I think. Why are they waiting? Why are they going from Friday to Tuesday? Doesn't it seem oh they want to skip the whole NFL thing, do you think? Or they're scared? The, Probably hockey scared. They want to stay NFL? away from the Vikings going five and oh. That's what. Well, now you just no, I think that. Hey everyone, play start betting. <laughs> Get against the Vikings heavy. Okay, well then on Tuesday, the Stanley Cup champions, Florida Panthers, will raise their banner and they take on the Boston Bruins. Will Jeremy Swayman be a net? I don't think so. Ooh. So yeah, it doesn't look like it. Chicago then squares off against Utah. So, Betsy, of course, on night one of North American hockey. The one I still don't get as far as, like, the triple header, the national triple header for opening night. Blues and Kraken, really? Couldn't come up with anything I, better it's than like, that? It's just like they need Is it in Seattle, I'm assuming? It's like they needed a West Coast start or something is what they were going for. I don't know. And yeah, I'm not, not trying to throw shade at the Blues or Kraken. If like our Wild, if it was like Wild and Kraken, I'd be like, this makes no sense too. And I love our Wild. Then on the next night on Wednesday, this is cool. I like this. So they have the six Canadian teams squaring off against each other. Yeah, that's cool. on opening night. You got Leafs at Canadians, Winnipeg at Edmonton, and Calgary at Vancouver. So again, some interesting games to kick off the season. You know the best part though, right now, Troy. And Louis, our team's undefeated. <laughs> we are undefeated. Yeah. So who's the uh, there's an odd man out, right? There's seven Canadian teams. Why didn't they get to play? Who's the other one? Who are we? Sp Toronto. No, Leafs are Canadians. Winnipeg at oh. Edmonton. Calgary at Vancouver. Who are we forgetting? Who am I missing? Ottawa. Oh, Ottawa. Ottawa. Oh, are well, they? Are they, are they an NHL Phil, team? Phil, go yell at someone. Yeah. Phil, go yeah. yell at someone. <laughs> oh yeah! Wow. You think after two hundred shows we'd know the Canadian hockey teams? But <laughs> we're work in progress, people here. Well, our team, because you know we got to make it all about us. They start the season kind of sad against the Blue Jackets at home on the tenth. So, oh, yep. 
So yeah. it's at Excel, not Columbus. Or it's not. Excel. Yeah. Okay. But I'm sure they'll do something. Yeah, they'll do. So- I'm sure every team's going to do something. Well, I think I know every team's wearing, wearing a decal, yeah. right? Though you're just yep. going to say, yeah. So. You guys feel ready for the start of the season? I it doesn't feel real to me at this point. Well, now that yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I'm ready. Now that you said it, I have to check it on my uh, fantasy team real quick. Hold on. Oh yeah, yeah, fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Josh, I got Clayton Keller. I did too. Oh, nice. We're in different leagues. There's two oh, leagues I'm, I'm, in Gong Show Fantasy. Yeah, I'm actually pretty psyched about my team. Okay. All right, go hi, real quickly. We'll all go through our teams just to, you know, satisfy our own <laughs> indulgences here. Who do you got, Troy? Okay, Posternock, Brady Kachuk, Rasmus Dahlin, Jack Eichel, Doogie Ham- Is it Dougie Hamilton? I always call him Doogie. Yeah, Dougie, but- yeah. <laughs> Clayton Keller, Carter Verhage, Eric Carlson. Oh, God. Someone who whoever wants him, I'll trade him. Jonathan Tavares, Demko, <laughs> Owen Tippett, Ekblad, Buchnevich, Chikrin. Joseph Wall and Jake DeBrusque with two rounds left. Yeah, who are your goalies? <laughs> so I got Wall, uh, Demko. Did I say Demko? Maybe. Yep, Demko, Wall, and that's it right now. I only have one goalie. So my team is McKinnon, Crosby, Bedard, <laughs> No Dobson, Doogie Hamilton, I guess, even though it's Dougie. <laughs> I know it's Dougie. I always call Doogie. <laughs> Timo Meyer, Clayton Kellers. I got Ovi and John Ooh. Carlson. Eh. U- UPL. Uka mm. Pekka UPL. Nice. Kevin Fiala. Wow, didn't need him. Apparently I do. Beckley, <laughs> Chris Letang. I got Buchnevich too, Troy. Nice. Ooh. Nikolai Ehlers, Thomas Shabbat, uh, Matias Ekholm, and Jacob Truba. What about you, Louis? Truba. Uh, Leon Dreisaitl, Sidney Crosby. Adam Fox, Alexander Barkov, Jasper Bratt, Matt Boldy, Chris Kreider, um, Mr. John, is it John Carlson, D. Yeah, Washington. Like 50. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Shea, Theodore, Jacob Markstrom, goaltender, Nick Suzuki, Chris Letang. Um, I don't even know who this is. Jay McCann. Oh, Jamie McCann. Seattle. Jamie. Um, or James, Martin, James, James, like Martin Nick, Nietzsche, 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 yeah, Nietzsche, Dawson Mercer, and Mr. Dustin Wolf. Oh, you got Dustin Wolf, that's pretty cool. And Big now, I of, just, uh, and now, I just, Jared, I just, I just Jared got, McCann. Sorry, those are bug me. I didn't get that right. We're all like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then okay, I just well, got Mark Stone. How are you still drafting? And Troy <laughs> yeah. just got Gabe Velarde. Yeah, Gabe Velarde. Oh, yeah, we're still going. One more round. Left. Okay. okay you know, we've the, we've born, we put enough people to sleep. <laughs> boring. Well, this won't put people to sleep. Well, I guess some kind of big news out of the mm-hmm. hobby today. It is big news, but I think that there's a little more bark than bite, if that's the correct way to put it. Mm-hmm. So Fanatics today, yesterday for everyone else, I guess today for us, yesterday for you, announced that it had signed Bedsy to an exclusive memorabilia deal where he'll be signing jerseys, photos, and other equipment only with Fanatics. Now, what a lot of people kind of rightly assumed, right? Because the headline is, Fanatics signs Bedard to an exclusive memorabilia deal, right? That, oh my gosh, are there no more Bedard autos? Does this mean the cup wouldn't have autos or that there's (laughs) going to be no more autos next year? Is this... Fanatics going completely fired. Shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> at at upper deck. And that's not the case. So this deal does not include trading cards. Upper deck will still have the exclusive rights to that. And actually, it is not super unique that Fanatics already has deals with a number of NHL athletes like Austin Matthews and Alexander Ovechkin. I should have already said to you, just, you know, Fanatics does sponsor the show. We always want yeah. them. We want to get that out there for full disclosure and transparency. But what I find most interesting about this whole deal, guys, is that we've, I think, all heard the narrative that, well, Fanatics doesn't care about hockey. That they, they don't, they would never even try to go after the license. It's like, well, they're making the jerseys now. They have Ovi and Bedard and 
AM34, Austin Moustache, <laughs> signed to auto deals. Feels like they care about hockey to me. And yeah. I think that they're, it, it kind of feels like, again, like uh, another sign that the walls might be closing in a little bit on upper deck and that there could be an eventual bullseye on that trading cards license. And you have to assume at the very least, I would think at this point that they're going to make a run at it. Now, whether the NHL and NHL PA decides to stick with upper deck, we'll have to all. Yeah. I mean, they got a very long, long relationship with the current with upper deck. I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's not odd. It's just very intriguing watching all the developments and, Eventually, at the end of the day, I keep saying this money will talk. And if they throw out so much ridiculous money that the NHL and the NHLPA is like, all right, <laughs> you know, what? we got to do what's in the best interest, right, for the league and revenues and all that and the players, it'll be interesting. The other thing I think about too is Upper Deck has a lot, of, has had a lot of these memorabilia deals. That's what they've had, like with Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan. They have one with Gretzky and I know McDavid. Yep. And Right away, Upper Deck was one of their what, what signature athletes or spokesmen, or I, I can't remember exactly how they put it. Wouldn't you think that they would have had them or him in a memorabilia I, I deal totally, too? I totally thought they did. I Maybe totally it thought they did. Or I don't yeah, know. but then I started remembering. It's like I'm going to the expo. I just like they didn't have a big autograph picture of Bedard like they do of all the McDavid and stuff at their booths. But yeah, I would have thought they would have locked him up. But maybe he didn't mm -hmm. want it. Maybe he knew bidding war or his management or something. Who knows? But and you have those monumental boxes they sell. Then like yeah. that's where you get like the skate that's autographed or a jersey yep. or a really nice print or something like that. So I don't know what we we're talking about. Remember we were asking if the jersey still have fight straps? This one does. So <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, there you go. And or, yes, or, or I was gonna say, did you see the someone tweeted out they ordered one of the new fanatics jerseys? And again, no. this is, I'm just a full disclosure fan. I the sponsor of the show. It was an Erickson Eck and it came with his last name. Erickson Eck is one word. It didn't oh. have the hyphen or anything. So I was like, oops. I'm sure you can get that fixed. Oh, well, you better be able to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're like 500 bucks, right? Yeah. Those, the auth, don't ask me all the levels, like the authentic, mm -hmm. authentic, I'll call it. I mean, those are spendy. Super ridiculous that well, I don't feel so bad charging thirty dollars for a t-shirt. <laughs> oh, it's case. I mean, you go to a, like where was the last pro sports game I went to? It was probably a Twins game, and sweatshirts were like a hundred bucks. I mean, obviously, I get there's a markup at the stadium and everything, but <clears throat> different times, the maybe. That, the thing that gets me because I'm sure you guys are the same way. You remember like being a kid and going to the baseball like a baseball game, and I remember. The thing I always wanted was like the the major league hat, right? The fitted yeah. cap that the players wore. Yes. Aren't they like fifty or sixty dollars? <laughs> they ain't cheap. They ain't cheap, man. Holy cow. That's yeah. just crazy. All right, but to close this off, I just want to get both of your opinions on this. Are are you guys thinking like I am that at the earliest opportunity that they're gonna go hard for this license? Yes. I would I mean, if the NHL does decide to bring Fanatics in, I, I I would hope they do a dual deal or would have more than one. But knowing the way these leagues work and how it is, it's, it seems like it's one manufacturer and that's all they want to deal with. So I don't think it will happen. But I think they're definitely going to make a play for it. Yep, I think this is just their baby, big baby step into that now. I wonder, too, like if you really do like game theory or kind of like map out like what, how this could potentially play out. I wonder if in any case upper deck would learn from the Panini experience. In yeah. Remember they put an, I don't know how strong or I can't remember an offer to buy Panini. What are the odds that today Panini wouldn't go back in time and take that offer? Yeah. Right. What are they now? Right. Yeah. They have the prism brand and some of their other brands, but without licenses, they don't mean much. Do and they still have soccer? Did Fanatics get that too? I should know this, but... I'm pretty sure Fanatics has it, and so yeah. I, I worry most about a world where Upper Deck retains its IP and has no license. It has no license, no yeah. Cup. There's no Young Guns. There's no OPG. 
right? It, it's like that would really stink. Now it would be cool to have like tops chrome hockey, but if fanatics, if it's like an eventuality to that they end up with the license, I would prefer that they, you know, buy upper deck and make all the good people there, you know, rewarded. Yeah. For that. I'm I'm that. On, on Panini's site. They have NIL stuff, college football cards. It's pretty funny. <laughs> That's like scrambling for existence there. Yeah. Yeah. They got right, we'll to move la- on. I was gonna say they gotta milk the last years of because they still have the NBA for a year, right? And then mm-hmm. that goes away and oh, they still have football. I don't know. They have football, but, they, but they've lost well that, that whole big NFL PA thing, right? They're just like, well, we're leaving. <laughs> well, and they they, si- they signed all these guys to exclusive autos. So it's like what it really stinks now to be a basketball or football collector, yeah, is you have licensed Wembenyama rookie cards but you can't get an auto right you can't get a licensed Wembenyama yeah. rookie auto it has to be a tops yep. thing it has to be unlicensed and so i you know that's in sort of the corporate battleground here for these licenses in some ways the collectors are not winning no and the hobbyists are not winning okay we're gonna move on last story in hobby news another kind of crazy mm. one yeah, you got to fill me in on this. I'm so confused and <laughs> what's going I don't on. Really, I don't really know. It's it's the contract stalemate between Jeremy Swayman and the Boston Bruins. There's a it's getting ugly. There's mm-hmm. a whole bunch of back and forth between what Swayman says he wasn't offered, what Buffalo, what Boston says they have offered him, whether or not they're even returning phone calls, whether they're talking. You have the Spitting Chicklets podcast, which somehow is like involved in this left and right. And the whole thing is just, he's, it's so strange how they're managing the relationship with him, not, not even the contract. And yeah. it kind of goes back to his last contract, I think, was there, what was it, the arbitration deal or, or but hockey doesn't have arbitration. Do you want me to go to capwages.com? Everyone, <laughs> capwages.com is our new cap friendly. One Why am I time. blanking out though? Do they does hockey do arbitration or was it as restricted? It's whatever they go where they have to like state their case. I think, yeah, and, the, and the, basically the team sits right in front of you and tears you a new one and tells you why you don't deserve <laughs> how much. Yeah, money and remember you the case of Swayman, it got brutal. Yeah, and it definitely left, I think, a bad taste in his mouth mm-hmm. after that. And this seems to be headed down that road. And where I'm just confused by this whole situation is you've got a young, you know, maybe the best young goalie prospect in all mm-hmm. of the NHL. And they have at least enough confidence in him to trade a Vesna winner and open the door for him to be kind of the guy in net there. And now you're squabbling. And the, these contract negotiations have gotten just ridiculous. They've gotten very public yep. where you have Cam Neely making comments, president of the Bruins. Then you have Swayman's agent, Louis Gross, replying on social media, refuting yeah. claims that as far as, as what he offered. And yeah, and then now Bruins coach Jim Montgomery already announced that uh, Eunice Corposalo will be the opening night starter. So he's not even to be there opening night. And like we've seen Bruins fans in our discord that, you know, taking different sides, right? Some take the team, some take the player. The one thing that I've heard about Swayman in this is that, and I don't know if this is convenient logic on his part, but he said something to the effect of he sort of feels responsible. And I'm sure you get pressure. I know you do like from the, the players association to, um, set a contract that that helps the overall goalie market yeah. like he doesn't want to if he thinks that uh, i think he's looking for like eight and a half million aav and if he takes like 7.8 or something then that does sort of reset well, right because carry price is right the highest paid goalie right now and he hasn't paid in three years or something mm-hmm. like that yeah something like that but again it, it's like this kind of reminds me of the whole zegras thing last summer doesn't it yeah a little bit where you question it's like do you like want this guy because you go through these contract negotiations and there's so many hurt feelings i can't believe that that doesn't carry over to the performance on the ice i don't know what do you make of this Troy? you know 
I think what I saw the eight by eight, whatever eight for sixty four million. What what did that put him at? It would have been like eighth highest goalie, I think, in in for salary. And but I'm also I'm totally a player side guy. Like I think the players should try to get as much as they possibly can. I I'm curious. <sighs> I am curious what happened, but like where the breakdown became. Like if they're they're saying they never even got that number, the eight by eight for sixty four million, yeah. and then now it seems like we're squabbling over hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe, which is a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, is not for this. And I just I don't get what the end game now is with the Bruins. If they need a goalie that is a, looks like he's going to be the future, I would get him signed, and I'd probably <laughs> do it for whatever he's looking for. But then again, Cam Neely seems very grumpy, very or not grumpy, but I don't know what the right word is. They're businessmen, right? They're trying to save face. Now that's gone public, it seems like it's all broken down. So I don't know. They just need to take a break, take a deep breath, and get back together. But I don't, I don't think they want to lose Swayman. That's my whole thing. We'll take him. We got, well, we got. We, what do we don't have four goalies on our roster? <laughs> Sure. We got Wonder Kid, Jesper Walston. <laughs> How old is Swayman? You want to look that up real quick, Louis? He He's got to be what, like 24? Was 25. All I'll tell you this is that I try to think of myself at 25. It's going to take a lot of emotional EQ or emotional strength to go through this experience. And like, let's say they do sign him and then show up for work with a smiley face the next day. I, yeah. Would you be able to do that at 25? I would be, you know, I was full of like yeah. P and V P and V yep. at that. Uh, and I think I would have been a pretty grumpy soldier and yeah. had a lot of resentment towards the team. That's why I just don't understand like how they're managing this. Well, yeah. And he, make... So Lou, you're right. It, he's 25 and it's, he's a restricted free agent, right? So this is where mm-hmm. another team could swoop in, right? And do an offer sheet and try to get him. Now I know it doesn't happen a lot, but when you're a restricted free agent, I think another team can try to sign you, but you have to like the Bruins could match it or match it. If they don't, then they have to get compensated, which I, if I know we say this all the time, go to the athletic. There was a great article on, <laughs> on these offer sheets and how GMs can try to use it to screw each other. But yeah. Well, it's, it's somewhat like taboo in hockey, which I don't understand. Like, it's considered like poor, like when the Blues signed uh, Dylan Holloway and who yeah. else, right? The defenseman that, but it's like if it's a tool available to you, I don't understand yeah. why you can't use it. Well, Jeremy Swayman is a 2021 22 Young Guns PSA 10 pop 974, 33% gem rate, last sold for 108 US dollars on September 29th, up about 20% to the past two weeks. And up about the same twenty percent in the past three. Months. I, I sold this raw for like a hundred bucks when it came yeah. when it was first released. That's a really nice looking, yeah, Young Guns card. It's a great card. I think. It's a great card. We're gonna move on to new product releases, and just a reminder: new product releases are brought to you by our friends at Mint Inc. in Canada. They are the place to order all your hockey boxes in Canada, as and they are an upper deck. Authorized internet retailers, so you can get your hockey products from them all throughout the country, not just in the Toronto area where their shops are. So we have another uh, kind of important update Mm -hmm. to the upcoming release calendar. New product releases are really going to heat up starting next week. Uh, So to review on kind of what's coming for hockey products, the next big Bedsy Rickier release in twenty is 2023-24 Metal Universe this upcoming Wednesday, October 9th. We're going to do the checklist preview on Monday show. Then a week later, we have our first uh, kind of real big 2024-25 release in Series 1, where we're going to get a whole new crop of Young Guns rookie cards. And then after that, this is kind of the new part of the release. It's a monster. 2023-24 SP Authentic. So we'll have Bedard Future Watch Autos hitting eBay before month's end because it comes out October 30th. Trick or treat, I guess, huh? Yeah. Must be authentic. I had a question for you, Troy. If you had a guess today, oh. what do you think the first Bedard Future Rush Auto inscribed goes for? Does it hit north of twenty thousand? I, I US? think so. I think so. I, Just it's the first fifty. 
it's the ambiance of the future watch auto i'm, I'm kind of trying to base yeah. it off that opg platinum emerald surge that's out there floating around yeah. and, at slab sharks i think it could get to 20k for the first one what about you louis you think that does more than 20k yep okay. i do <laughs> there it is. Was yeah. another baba louis hobby hot take <laughs> I love the explosion. At the end there. <laughs> so again, October 30th is when SP Authentic come out, comes out. Pre-sales right now at Minting in Canada are 600 Canadian. In the US, David Adams, 500. That's a, that's the equivalent of like 675 Canadian. Why are stuff always a better deal in Canada? Yeah, Ooh, it might be worth Canadians? our gas money every few months just to drive up <laughs> right. the bank and buy our well, well. There. What's the closest shop to the borders? Or one in Winnipeg probably? Yeah. Is that the closest? Well, and then I got in going through like the release calendar, I got a little curious as to like kind of where we're at with all the Bedard rookie year products. Mm -hmm. And which, of course, are the 2023 24 releases. So uh, I went and I wrote them all down like, what's come out? What is yet to come out? And I think I counted 19 2023 24 products that have already been released that have Bedard rookies. And then there's at least 10 left. So here's what I have that's left. We have Metal Universe, which is next week. Then, yep. Sky, then SP Authentic at the end of the month. Then my favorite, Skybox EX2000. <laughs> we have Ingrained that's coming back. I was Parker's like, what's Chan Ingrained? But then I remember, yeah, that's coming yeah. back. Parker's Champions. Yeah. Woo! Again, these are all 2023-24. Ultimate Collection. Mirror. Clear Cut. Whatever stature is going to be, <laughs> but he said that it's going to be, and then the cup. Yeah. So there could be a couple I forgot to. Now, so there's 19 out, 10 left. Per TCDB, there's already been 795 Bedard cards released in the 2023-24 set. So that's unique cards. So if you extrapolate, that's an average of 53 Bedards per set, and you extrapolate that over the next or the 10 that are left our current pace oh, or trend will be to have 1,325 unique Bedard rookie <laughs> cards in the 2023-24 sets. And early on, we estimated there be there would be between 1,300 and 1,500. So oh, that like would be... Yeah. Nice. We were spot on. Now, why couldn't we like pick like a card that's going to triple in value? <laughs> make money? We, we're good at estimating totally useless stuff that benefits us in no ways. Yeah, rookie but, cards, XRCs. XRCs, those are in there. And it's logical, and I don't think a big shock, but yeah, there will be more Hunter Bedard rookie cards than any other mm -hmm. player in the history of hockey. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then we got to mention too, literally what, five minutes? <laughs> five recording. minutes before we record. We did get the announcement that 2023 24 credentials goes live today on EPAC. Uh, very quick. I, I think you were thinking, Troy, that that Upper Deck might be trying to get those faster on the EPAC, or I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if they're as the, it seems like they are, but I listen. I, I yeah. I'm an impact expert. Yeah. I, I still can't pull the trigger on anything. I, I always go out there and then I just look at the price and I'm like, you know, I can just go to the shop or go. How many online. times have you been close to buying something? Oh, on I've had Parker's Champions in my shopping cart on EPAC probably five times, five to six times. <laughs> I just couldn't pull the trigger. <laughs> have you ever opened up a box on EPAC, Baba Louie? Nope. Do you see yourself doing it? No. Or do you just enjoy the in hand? I need it. Physical. Yeah. Me too. I, I prefer it that way. All right. Fanatics. Got to make a mention for them and do our weekly Fanatics Collect preview. So, Fanatics Collect is a gong show partner and sponsor. We're thankful for their support of our show. Mark your calendars for Thursday, October 10th. That'll be the starting date for the October Fanatics Collect Premier Auction which will then run through the 24th. So it goes two weeks. There's always grail cards available in the premiere. Can't wait each month to see what hockey cards will find their way into the auction. While the premiere is a week and a half away or so, the current week, the auction is live. It ends this upcoming Sunday night, like every week with the fanatics collect weekly. There's some very cool, interesting cards. Troy, the one and only Baba Louie and myself have each picked out our favorites. We're going to review them now, starting with vintage. Boom. I bended the space time continuum <laughs> once again. Yeah, this one deserves it though. And shoehorn a kind of like a, I don't know, borderline. Well, it's, I don't think it's even borderline vintage 
I don't even know what it's called, but it's a 1998 Bowman's Best Atomic Refractor Wayne Gretzky out of 100. Yes, a 10. Are you guys Bowman or Bowman? Bowman. I would say Bowman. Yeah, okay. Yeah, me too, I think. What's funny, too, is I, lo- I was looking through our alliance, and I think Louis picked a modern card that was, like, produced mm-hmm. before this. So. <laughs> <Good. laughs> we're, we're just introducing everyone to the concept of gongshou logic. Right? <laughs> we just do We make up our own rules here. So, But I had to talk about it in my because, in my opinion, this is a Gretzky Grail card. If you're a serious Gretzky collector, especially if you have a penchant for the late 90s stuff, then I think this is a big, big card. If you've ever, if you've never seen a 98 atomic refractor in person, there's also almost no way to that a photo can do it. Just, this is maybe one of the better photos of one, mm-hmm. that I've seen, but the in-person experience is still a million times better. Now, I was way more into girls in 1998. I was a soccer <laughs> Minnesota than hockey cards. So I didn't discover these until I was into adulthood. Uh, physically, I'm still a total child mentally, of course. Uh, anyways, these I would have thought like back in the day, these must have blown people's minds. <laughs> From, uh, yeah, you know, we have so much shiny, like sparkly cards today yeah. and refracting that I can only imagine kind of how the hobby reacted to them. So how I would describe it is like these cards is sort of refracting kaleidoscope meets stained glass. Is that is there a better way to put to it? Our, you're dead on. Do kids to kid any young kids today know <laughs> what a kaleidoscope is? You held up the yeah, tube to your not. your eye and you spun it, and it <laughs> basically yeah. these shards would circle around and flip around. What was the set that? It was like a drawing set and it used like protractors and you could make like like fancy like almost like doily type you know what I'm talking about though. Oh, those with talking. like like the gear edges. Yeah, Not yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the thing where you had the sand or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that made me you just made me think of that right. Okay, back to the card though. Wayne's in a Rangers jersey on the card. Still in his, it's still a plain days card too, as he was in the last stint of his career at the time in New York. Mm-hmm. Now there's 150 base cards in the 1998 Bowman's best hockey set. The atomic refractor is a parallel. So all 150 cards have the atomic refractors numbered out of a hundred. Now, 17 copies of this card have been graded by PSA. PSA 10 pop count is five. There's seven PSA nines, four PSA eights and one PSA seven. You guys big fans of the atomic refractor. Do you kind of put it up in that? 90s sort of grail territory what about yeah, you yeah they, they always look awesome i don't collect them i've never bought one but i like every time i see one it's kind of probably because we always see the high-end one where i'm like mm-hmm. oh that's awesome i can't afford it <laughs> it's spendy yeah yep do you like still, them, i do yeah i i'm still in that sparkly phase i like that stuff that eye catching mm-hmm. you like sparkles so i like sparkles yeah this is one i'd love to have in my pc someday for sure now, there's only been ever one sale of a 1998 wow. Bowman's Best Wayne Gretzky Atomic Refractor, the PSA 10. There's been like other graded and raw, but PSA 10, and it sold in November 2022 for 7,000 US dollars. I don't think it'll get back up to that. Do you? No. I'm thinking like four to five. And that was like, that was like prime pandemic. Yeah, right? coming November right out 20... of the pandemic, man. All right, Trey, got the next one. Oh, do you want a current bid on that one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. what's the current bid? 1,525 US dollars. Sweet. Sweet. All right, here's what I went with. An actual vintage card. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> 1961 no. Parker's yeah. Claude Provost. Number 50, PSA 8. Again, love Parker's cards. This is a later Parker's card, right? 1961. We usually mm-hmm. talk about the 50, was it 51s, 52s? We drool over those but here's a 61 i think the card looks awesome it's like it's a psa 8 grade but man it looks really good <laughs> like it looks really good off centered a tad for sure on the front of the card definitely off centered there Ugh. but man edges and corners look fantastic like maybe bottom right there might be something with that mm-hmm. edge or the bottom left but barely man it's it this card for PSA 8, I mean, I think it looks fantastic. 
Like the colors kind of make my eyes go buggy. It's just staring. The yellow? At the card. Yes. The yellow. Yeah, the yellow does. Um, I dig it, though, and I was just going to say that I think it's probably, like, hit or miss with people. Like, it's this yeah. is one of those cards where you are into it or it's not for you. Yeah, and you'll see some of these are crazy. Like, the Toronto ones might have, like, pink maple leaves in the background, if I remember right, or something like that. So, yeah, if you can get through the background, I mean, the picture, I think, is fantastic. And it looks really nice, really colorful. But, yeah, you do have to deal with the yellow Canadian logo. And if that kind of irritates you, this probably isn't your card. But I think this one looks absolutely fantastic. And because it's an early Parkhurst, it's got mm -hmm. a little cartoon on the back. So we have a cartoon now. Here's the deal with this card. You can barely see it. It looks like, I don't know. I can't really tell what's going on, but these are like rub off cards is what they called. So mm -hmm. at the back of the card, there's a punchline to a joke and you had to rub that part off to see it. Now this card states, even though you can't read it here, I found what it says. And it says, girls are always falling for me. I trip them. That must be the joke. Ha ha. Funny, funny. Boom, boom. Again, in today's society, that probably doesn't play very well. No, but no. It is what it is. This is the 60s. And then I was like, well, does that joke supposed to tie to this picture? Because I don't know what's going on. I mean, I know what's going on in this picture. He's got like a popsicle, but very, very odd picture to put with that joke. So that's we'll just leave it at that. I don't understand it. The joke I get, but what yeah. they're going for. Oh, here it says at the bottom card for the punchline rub under cartoon with Penny. So that's on the back. I always love fun backs. But our boy Claude Provost, nine times Stanley Cup winner. Just nine cups. That's it? Just nine. Average. One one time Bill Masterton winner and first winner of the Bill Masterton trophy. For his career, 254 goals, 335 assists, 589 points in 1,005 NHL games played. Played his entire career with Montreal. Fun fact, Provost has won the most Stanley Cups by a player not in the Hall of Fame. Another fun fact, he has also the most all-star game appearances of all eligible non-Hall of Fame players with 11. Hmm. Final fun fact, he holds the record for fastest goal in any period in an NHL game at four seconds. That doesn't even seem possible, but... I was <laughs> mentally going through that. Like, Say that again. Fastest goal in any period of an NHL game at four seconds. Oh, wow. Yeah. He had to have it, shot the puck. Like, I mean, yeah. It's like, line. did it come back to him? He shot it, goalie fell over. Because I, if I remember, I think it was like in the second period or something. I, I remember I tried to look it up. But uh, current bid for this card, $18, which, man, I think this is just a great card. That's it. Great card. Good storyline. It'll go up, but. Yeah, but dang. Did I not look up? Oh, sorry, I forgot to look up past sales. You're forgiven. Bob Louie. Okay. It's okay. Okay, 1965, Coca-Cola Hockey Perforated, Stan Makita, PSA 7. Um, going through the site, I noticed there were a few of these 65 Coca-Cola Hockey yeah. Perforated so cards in there. And I had never seen them before myself, so thought I'd dig into them a little bit. I learned, and I'm happy to pass along to all of you, that in order to get your 6566 Coca-Cola hockey cards, you had to drink a lot of Coke products. Mm, I'm sure. Just to get one team set of 18 cards, you had to collect 10 bottle caps from Coca-Cola or Sprite that had the desired team name on the inside cap liner. You then mailed the 10 cap liners or caps into Coca-Cola and they mailed you back the team set of 18 mm. cards. All these cards were connected in a row, perforated for easy separation. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. So okay. there's six teams still then, right? No? Or were there more? Because So if you had... There's yeah, because the expansion yeah. Was, wasn't 67, the first big expansion. North Stars, right? I don't know. We don't 18 know. players from six teams. Oh, there you go. Six eight. teams. Six teams. Right? Oh, yeah. So, so you had to drink 60 <clears throat> bottles on average. I could do it. <laughs> yeah. well you guys are pepsi guys so you wouldn't even well do you remember now this i'm going off the rails because now i get bitter when i think about this do you remember when you used to look under the cap and it would say you know you you win a free Winner? pop or a buy one yeah. get one free yep. they don't do that anymore that's dumb no. all right louis sorry to derail you <laughs> that's totally fine um so each team 
like I said, came with um, in a set of 18. And then there was an additional 19th card that you could get that you would mail back into Coca-Cola and you got an album to put the cards oh. in. Mm. So the set contained 108 unnumbered black and white cards featuring 18 players from um, from the six NHL teams. So yeah. to dig a little deeper, describing the card for our listeners, they are two and three quarters by three and a half inches, had simple black and white on the front, or the black and white on the front with a picture of the player and their name in a standard font on the bottom. On the back, it was just the facts, Jack. Name, <laughs> vitals, birthplace, birth date, position, height and weight, and their last amateur club, and their stats in the NHL. Vitals, like their blood pressure? Vitals, baby. <laughs> um, I'm in no way able to tell you how to grade these cards as they are perforated, so I guess it's just going to come down to some su- subjective grading. <laughs> it's like Sports Illustrated for kids cards. That's, that's, yeah, that's exactly that's, what I thought really about when I saw that. Confusing. The other thing I don't like about <laughs> this particular copy, well, not the card, it's that you get these sort of unorthodox sized cards and there isn't really a slab to fit it and it's yeah correct feels like it's like all over the place in the <laughs> slab um so on this one i guess maybe it gets a seven because if you zoom in on it you can see some fuzzy hairs i don't know if they need to be cleaned up yeah i, I really have no idea like at the top no right? idea um other thing i can see yeah it's just a little maybe mistrimmed on the top and it's off center left to right other than that no. um jeremy calls that diamond cut where it's like not cut mm. in a straight line so and i actually think the perfect edges are probably fine it's probably the centering and that yeah. sort of off cut if i had to guess as to why or what are the things that detracted from the grade okay give me one second here i gotta catch back up to my notes because my <laughs> mouse died <laughs> oh i'm sorry were you close <laughs> yeah i'm very close um so i guess looking at this cartoon being coca-cola with the name thought maybe it would be a hot ticket for someone that had the love for coca-cola memorabilia or hockey but the name coca-cola isn't on there anywhere so it might be the reason <laughs> just um, in the slab right yeah, yeah that's a whole other world of collecting you want to go down the, the rabbit cards hole. Coca-Cola, yeah. holy cow. Yes. For the, there's Post and all those Canadian food yeah. companies seem to have cards. I did find a set online at another place um with almost all the cards still together for 180 for 185 US dollars. Um hmm. last sale that I could find of this card was in a PSA 8 grade that sold for 108 US dollars. This one's a 7. Troy, where's that bid at? Seven U.S. dollars. Ooh. When was his rookie year? Would sixty-six be a Mikita rookie? Would that? I don't even know. I don't know either. Yeah, maybe we can look that up. Okay, we're gonna switch to modern. Fifty-eight. Uh, <laughs> what? Fifty-eight. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oops. Close. <laughs> Hey Louis, can you bring back that bring back that rewind button you talked about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm All still right. dumb. Okay, <laughs> modern 2015 OPG Platinum tracks Connor McDavid rookie auto out of 125 BGS 9.5 10 with the auto grade. And I've been clearly on the record in stating I don't prefer OPG yeah. Platinum autos to the yeah. regular cards, but I gotta admit this one's pretty cool. It's the tracks parallel. I don't know what that means, but it's supposed to be like tire tracks or something like that. But in 2015, the the tracks was more like a a rainbow foil Mm -hmm. silver kind of coloring. When you get down to it, though, it's a McDavid Ricky Auto from a very popular set with a gem grade from BGS and an auto 10 grade kicker too. So it's going to be pretty spendy on the list. The one thing, though, that I don't know if you guys noticed, but... So it's a gem mint plus, right? It's all nine, three nine point fives yep. and a ten. It's got a nine point five centering. Do you want to explain that to me? I was looking at that as you were talking. I I think just I don't know what their back end rules are, but th- I do I do think this left side is a little bit thicker than the right. The top too, right? Top for sure. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, still a nice card. Yeah, it's off, but it's a cool looking card. Regardless. PSA 10. It'd be PSA 10. Now, here's what I think about this. Like, what, what I try to think. So I'm going to, I want to go through actually earlier than usual, sort of like the recent sales. So the yeah. last sale of the 2015-16 OPC <coughs> Platinum McDavid Rookie Auto Tracks out of 125 BGS 9.510 was in July 5400 US. That was also the all-time high sale for the grade. Now check this out. A BGS 10 sold in November 2021 for 17,500. So you get to a card like this, you have these OBG Platinum autos. They're, I kind of feel like that they're getting close to like a Future Watch Auto type mm. value or certain cup autos or like exquisite autos. Do you guys see like OPT Platinum autos on that level? Or like, like let's say I said, here's seven grand, go buy, but you have to buy a McDavid auto. Are you, where in the ranking are you kind of like, as far as like sets you check out first? <laughs> Not, Am I making sense there? Yeah. I, the, when you said that OPT Platinum isn't what would pop into my head to go look for. So I yeah. don't, and, and, with approaching Future Watch Auto, I mean, I maybe with the like this out of one twenty five versus a nine ninety nine, maybe, but I I don't know. Like, I don't think of OPG Platinum in that realm, but they are but some might though because yeah. it, it does it is the closest equivalent, yeah, to like a prism, right? Like like a if you were a basketball football, yeah, player. true. I think a lot of the prism autos are stickered too. Have you ever noticed that? Like in other sports, oh, that... man, Panini ninety percent of their autos are stickers. Oh, yeah. It's just, these go for a lot of money, but it, it is. It's a obviously a very popular set. It's mm-hmm. out of one twenty five. It's got a very high grade, so it doesn't really shock me. And I believe last time I checked it was the highest or the bid card in the auction to this point. But you got a current bid? I think it is three thousand five hundred U.S. dollars. Yeah, so I mean, it's probably hit that 5k mark, no problem. Are right, you got the next one, Troy? I do. Whoa, zoomed in. Ooh, nice. <laughs> All right, this one's gonna be quick. Just I think it's a great looking card. That's why I did 2018 Upper Deck the Cup. Elias Pedersen, who just joined the Gong Show Troy fantasy team this year, spoken so. into existence. <laughs> yeah, spoken into existence. Rookie patch auto out of 99. BGS nine grade, and I believe I looked at the back and it has a ten autograph. I don't know why, but I always look at that stuff. Population one of fourteen with just two graded higher at BGS. So I just think it's a really, really nice looking card out of ninety nine. Four color patch. There's blue. There's silver. There's green. There's white. What do we got? One, two, three breaks. It looks like. Four. I, I think because you got a little bit of blue at the top, right? One, two. Does that count? Oh, it's the four at the top, top, like. Oh, no, no. I think you're right. You have four color. I never right. know. I just count and think. But I love when the patches have these. I love stitching. Yes. Like, mm-hmm. I love seeing the stitching. I love when it's hanging off, even though I know it drives Josh crazy. I like when it looks like it's been ripped and used. I just think it's a really, really nice when you patch. The auto looks really nice. Now, be aware, it does go up into his jersey. So some people might not like that. <gasps> I've seen copies just like this one. I've seen other copies where you stayed in the box. But just be aware of that. But it doesn't bother me one bit. I know he signed the card. Card looks fantastic. And plus, it's a thicky patch boy, and it got a PS or a BGS nine, so that's always mm-hmm. a good sign because usually these cards can be pretty rough when you get them graded. Looks like this one got dinged the most on corners, which you can definitely see. You can definitely see some chipping on the corners. But center, you got a ten. Edge is nine. Mm-hmm. Surface nine and a half. What's that? That's a beautiful sample. Of an Egan Wildcat soggy jersey. <laughs> it does. Oh, does like There's a reference wild. nobody will get. So. <laughs> You're right. Does look like the Egan Wildcats. <laughs> he does have very solid hockey mouth going on. So yep, good for little, Elias there. Mouth slightly agape. I'm just, that's my new word. Agape. It's my word of the day. Sounds dirty when you say that, even though it's not. But. <laughs> and I probably don't even know what it means. I'm probably using it wrong. Last sale of a VGS9 copy of this card I could find was via eBay. Verified in Terapeak. For three thousand three hundred ninety-two dollars twenty-eight cents wow. US oh. on October thirtieth of twenty twenty-three, and I told I was telling Josh before the show, this card was at forty-two dollars US yesterday. I'm like, what is going on? And then I looked, and it's at eight hundred US right now. Yeah. I don't think I don't know if I can get to that thirty-three hundred mark, but he was popping off at that yes. time last year. Yes, definitely. So 
that was a right time sale yep. there. Last card, Baba Louie. What did you pick? Whoa. Super super modern. <laughs> yeah. 1995 select certified gold team Wayne Gretzky. Number two, PSA eight. This where's the gold? I don't see it. I don't. Yeah. Just kidding. Me neither. Another card that I ain't seen before, but I figured I'd just bring it up because, of course, it's a waner. Everybody likes their wane. Um, I know that sounded dirty, but we'll we'll let that go. Thanks. Doing a little digging on this set since I knew nothing about it. It's a 10-card set with some of the league's top players. The certified gold team cards were randomly inserted in one in 41 packs. They call the material... Uh, double front, all foil, dufex, card design, gold foil design. Dufex? dufex. You're such a dufex, Louie. <laughs> what a dufex thing to say. Um, more on the card. Wayne in an LA Kings jersey. The card is very, very, very gold, like Josh brought yeah. up. Um, then just looking at the card, there really wasn't a lot for me to nitpick here. Maybe a little on the <laughs> bottom left corner. Oh, Troy. Troy, you gotta have mute again. Oh, I was just laughing. It looks the same to me. Gold, gold Wayne Gretzky, gold member from Austin Powers. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it looks the same. That's <laughs> awesome. I love it. Um, not a lot issue wise. If you're really into this card, maybe a little nick in the bottom left corner. Um, I did go on the back and take a look because I know how much Josh likes it when I can find something there to complain about, but it looks okay. Mm. Hey, different uh, picture. That's cool. I like yeah, when it's a different. Well, there's gold member again. But <laughs> like when it's a completely different picture. I like that. Very clean back too. You know, no yeah, very nice. stats. This that. Just a nice picture and his name. And um, it's a PA the PSA eight with a pop of fifteen, and there are twenty eight graded higher than this one. Uh, there were three PSA ten copies. Last sale, July third of this year for thirty two bucks. And Troy, we're all the way up to eleven U.S. dollars. Is that thirty-two dollars for a PSA ten or a PSA eight? eight. Like no, nope. eight. Okay, okay. I was like, wow. I'm sure PSA ten would be about a hundred. And I, it's like the ninety-four, ninety-five, ninety-six. Well, maybe ninety-four, ninety-five. Like those cards don't have the same sort of values that mm. the little bit later ones do. And so, part of me wonders in cards like this if there could be like a moment a couple years down the road where all of a sudden a card like this got really hot because it is kind of cool looking. And I wonder too how it, I've never seen one of these in person, but it probably looks a little bit better in person. What you think? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think these pictures are good too. Mm -hmm. Nice card. Good pick Louie. Thanks to, to bid on these six fantastic hockey cards and all the others available this week at the fanatics collect.com. All right. That's our show. If you like the episode, please leave a rating review on Apple, Spotify, whatever podcast app you listen to us on. If you love the show, you want to support us, you want to chat with us on the Hockey Cards Gong Show Discord server, please consider a $5 a month donation. Join our $199 support level tier on Patreon. Link is in the show description and our Insta uh, both podcast apps and YouTube, Instagram, TikTok profiles. You go to our website, hockeycardsgongshow.com. Click on the Become a Patreon link at the top of the page or go to the Patreon website directly, p a t r e o ncom and just search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. We're on social media. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And boys, the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a production of Dogbox Ventures LLC. Have an awesome Thursday, an awesome weekend. Have fun watching NHL hockey. Mm -hmm. And we'll be back with you on Monday. All right, Louie, take us out, bud. Bye.